Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Movie Change Up Podcast. This is our number one contenders match where we have two people going for a chance at the championship uh, next week. I'm Joe Fricky. I'm one of the co-founders and your host for tonight. I'm joined by Johnny Dupe, one of our other uh, co-founders and our other host and judge for the night. Uh, Johnny, so uh, these two people, the winner is going to face you for the championship. Is that going to affect how you judge it all? What are your thoughts? Any predictions on who's going to come out of this victorious? Um, It's not going to affect how I judge because I just want the best man to win. So whoever gives the best pitches is going to be the one worthy of the championship shot. Um, And I don't know, it's tough because I, I feel like Bobby's usually pretty consistent, um, and Tristan is usually kind of hit or miss on on a lot. So I, I think if it's if it's Tristan's on day, and I think he's coming prepared, I would say that uh, I would give the edge to Tristan. But Bobby's a tough competitor, so either way, I'm going to have a challenge ahead of me. All right, and uh, before we get too far, I should probably describe kind of what the rules are for this show. So basically, uh, the two judges get together and they come up with a list of seven movies and a list of seven rules and the competitors have to pitch reboots for those seven movies. They can, they have to use each rule once and they can't use a rule uh, more than twice. So they kind of have to pair up what movie fits with which rule. And then they go head to head pitching the reboots. Uh, so Tristan, uh, uh, you're, you know, coming into this out of a win against me. Uh, what are your thoughts? You've had a few weeks to prepare. I'm feeling pretty good, I won't lie. Uh, I wanted to be the one to take down Johnny, so I really want to win this week. But in the end, even if I don't, at least I lost to the one person who made Bobby lose. I mean, who made Johnny lose. Because Johnny, whether he likes to deny it or not, he he did lose. And I think that counts. And if I lose to the one person who's already beaten Johnny, I don't feel too bad. As long as somebody takes down Johnny next week, I hope it's me. But I got to root for someone. Yeah, and... uh... You root for yourself. And uh, Bobby, you know, your last win was against the champ himself, but kind of our system here is you got to win two in a row before you face the champ for the title. So are you feeling confident after last week's or your last win or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, look, every every week's kind of a crapshoot. I think we're all very good at this now. I was happy to get the win against Johnny last week, but, you know, to beat him twice would be a pretty big accomplishment. So that's what I'm uh, kind of hoping to do at this point. But Tristan is... You know, he's a great competitor, obviously, and it should be a tough battle. So I just want whoever wins this to give Johnny the best fight possible. You guys also, are too nice. Tristan, play the heel. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I played the heel long enough, Johnny. You, yeah. you he's only the heel towards you. you down. Right, I'm going right. to heal it up. Yeah. Well, right. based on Joe's uh, rules, I should change mine and use a rule twice. So. Uh, well. <laughs> yeah, Joe said you can't use one more than twice, so apparently our whole yeah. show is different. Yeah. Yeah, well, you ready. can't use a rule more than once. That's what, you know, that's what I was supposed yeah. to say, but didn't say. Um, anyway, so our seven movies that they're doing today are City Slickers from 1991, Hard Target from 1993, In the Mouth of Madness from 1994, The Page Master from 1994, Pretty Woman from 1990, Rebels of the Neon God, not Rebels of the Neon Demon from 1992, (laughs) and Stop or My Mom Will Shoot from 1992. And uh, Johnny, what are their seven rules for today? All right, our seven rules for these two losers are (laughs) one must star and be directed by Ben Stiller. Um, One must have an open-ended ending. Uh, One must be a 1970s movie. One must swap the genders of the original roles. One must feature Christopher Walken. One must put a director on the map. And our last rule, one must be set in an established fictional world. All right. And uh, before the show, we had a little competition to see who would uh, pick first. And I believe Bobby won that competition. So what movie are we going with and who's going first? Uh, let's do Pretty Woman, and I'll let Tristan go first. All right. And uh, I believe Johnny has the descriptions. I do. Pretty Woman came out, as Joe said, in 1990, directed by Gary Marshall. Um, in this modern update on Cinderella, I'm, okay, um, a prostitute and a wealthy businessman fall hard for one another, uh, forming an unlikely pair. While on a business trip in L.A., Edward, played by Richard Gere, who makes a living buying and breaking up companies, picks up a hooker, Vivian, 
uh, a classic Cinderella story played by Julia Roberts on a lark. Um, after Edward hires Vivian to stay with him for the weekend, the two get closer, only to discover there are significant hurdles to overcome as they try to bridge the gap between their very different worlds. All right, and I believe this was my pick, so I'm the overall you know, deciding factor in this round, so let's hear your pitch. All right, so for mine, I use the rule we'll start off right there and say it's uh, uh, starred and directed by Ben Stiller. So I have Ben Stiller and Nicole Kidman playing Edward and Vivian. Edward is kind of like this high-strung, anxious uh, accountant. He's working in New York City, and Vivian is a high-end, expensive prostitute. And they kind of know each other because they had this very, very brief one-night encounter in Vegas years and years ago when Ben Stiller was first starting out in the business. So they had this like one-night encounter way back in the day when they were both kind of young and new to what they were doing, but they haven't seen each other since then. And now, years and years later, Edward has taken a trip to a conference in Paris where he's reunited with Vivian, and they kind of immediately revive their attraction to, to each other. And they had this sort. They did decide to take this long weekend together while he's in Paris, and essentially they're staying together. And they're having these adventures through Paris while also kind of just having these conversations about uh, their lives and what got them there. And it, since they knew each other so long ago, and now they're in this different place in their lives, it's kind of causing them both to be to look at their lives and be like, oh, what did I? What choices did I make that brought me here? And it's crazy how different the paths could have gone from these two people who kind of crossed in the night years and years ago who are now in very different places. And I think what made the original interesting is it was very subversive in like how much it openly portrayed like sexuality and prostitution. And that was something that wasn't super talked about in like mainstream successful movies. And I wanted to turn that a little, make it a little more interesting for today where you're getting these older people who are kind of uh, feeling a little bit lost in their lives. Maybe they're having these unfulfilled marriages. Because I wanted to make it so their entire story is filled, is set in Paris. You have a flashback showing their first encounter, but the rest of the story is only in Paris. So you don't get a huge idea of what their lives are normally. It's kind of like like before sunrise, I guess. You're getting like this, this one weekend away with these characters. And I want to end on a similarly tragic note that they don't end up together but they have this tinge of like oh if you're ever in paris if you're ever in new york like maybe call me up maybe we'll see each other and they have this little thought in the back of their head like maybe if we've been on different paths at many different ways in different places we could have been together but because of our different paths in life we're not and i think ben stiller showed some ability to weave in drama with his comedy and i would like to see him do a more of a dramatic role like this so I, would, I think it would be a great opportunity for him to push his dramatic traps and to remake a classic movie with a, a new kind of modern lens on it. All right. Interesting. Bobby, what's your p take on Pretty Woman? All right. Well, to start off, um, the rule I used is that I am swapping the genders of the lead characters, um, meaning that mine is going to uh, change the title from Pretty Woman, which is a song, to another song, Sharp Dressed Man um, is the title of mine. And I have... Uh, Kristen Bell as my my lead. I, have, I named her Maddie, and then my um, Vic Ward, the stripper prostitute. And this one is going to be played by Channing Tatum. So we have Kristen Bell and Channing Tatum as my two leads. Um, so I have Maddie Lewis, a businesswoman, just finalized her divorce with her high-powered businessman husband before an important conference in Las Vegas. She tends to she um, is kind of feeling insecure and too weak a lot of the times, and used her husband as kind of the uh, to lead in a lot of this, these businesses. Uh, feeling lonely, she on the first night, she solicits the services of a male prostitute and stripper named Vic. After a wild night together, she has the idea to hire him for the week to pose as her rebound boyfriend at the conference, as her ex-husband will also be there. Um, her arc is, is kind of about self-confidence and self-esteem that he helps her kind of uh, generate throughout the movie. And his goes from, you know, he went to Vegas in order to be a legitimate dancer and resorted to stripping and prostitution. So we have kind of the arcs that they go through. We still get the same class, you know, kind of differences between them. Um, and I'm amping up the comedy in this because it's directed by uh, Nicholas Stoller, who did uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall and Neighbors, worked with Kristen Bell before. Um, and the tone is, again, like I said, more comedic. For example, I have a scene where uh, a group of the women from the business center from the conference go to the strip club that Vic strips at. And because he is already kind of established as her new boyfriend she has to like constantly distract them from seeing him so she acts like super drunk 
um, trying to stop them from like seeing him and stuff. So it's more a lot more comedic with the heart of also the comedy involved. Um, and also I, I wanted to update and change the genders because um, like at the time, sexuality, as far as that was very, um, as far as prostitution was a big, like that was a big step forward. And in this, it's more a women would like women hiring a, a sex worker is something that would be like not talked about. No one would ever think it could happen type of thing. And to have kind of a woman in, in the business position feeling that way and uh, like lonely and that she would do that is kind of what I'm at least, at least kind of uh, pushing forward in this one. All right. And then I just have, uh, I had a question for Tristan, but he kind of answered it towards the end. And that was more of like what his tone was going to be. My question for Bobby is what's like the ending of your movie? Do they end up together or is it kind of ambiguous or what's your, um, well, they, they both kind of realize their goals. Like they both helped each other get to a certain point. Like she is now very confident in her world without her husband there. And then he is, um, he auditions and gets a job as a legitimate dancer and they have like a moment at the end where like they're talking about what, cause they had broken up earlier yeah. and they have a moment and you're, you're a little unsure if they're fully back together, but they're at least like, they're at least talking and friends at that point. So you get like the hope of what it could be, but it's not like a full on miracle, happy ending type deal. Okay. Uh, Johnny, any questions for either of them? Um, not really. I can kind of picture both movies. I guess my question for, Tristan would be because you mentioned you want to go more comedic, but you also mentioned like before midnight. So I'm kind of in, but like stuck on trying to picture your tone with Ben Stiller directing because he's never directed anything close to before midnight. Most of his movies are straight comedies. So if you're going a little more in between, um, why do you think Ben Stiller is a good choice for that? I'm leaning honestly a bit more towards the drama side, and I think it's a it's a unique choice for Ben Stiller. But I think his interesting roles, like Royal Tenenbaums, it was a sort of a dramatic role for him. It was a comedic movie, but he was playing a dramatic role in that. And he had a movie a couple of years ago called Brad Status that I really liked, where his son is moving away to college and he's having this kind of uh, middle life crisis of saying like, "Oh wow, my kids are grown up now. I have the house to myself. Like we're empty nesters. What does that mean?" And I think I wanted to sort of give him a chance to explore that dramatic potential. I think when you see comedic actors like Jim Carrey who, or Robin Williams who take and once in a while do a drama turn, it's like usually very good. And sometimes I think these comedic actors have that drama underneath them. So I want to give Ben Stiller a chance to show that off. All right. All right. If you don't have any other questions, I'll put five minutes on the – okay, I'll put five minutes on the clock and let them fight it out starting now. I'll start off and say that I really like my Ben Stiller choice. I think that it's uh, more interesting than just swapping the genres or swapping the genders. It's like, okay, I guess that's something. But I think Ben Stiller is doing this would be, be interesting too because you're getting a comedic actor doing this dramatic role and that would be something that would get attention from a lot of people. Like, oh, we got to see this attempt by Ben Stiller to be dramatic and that would be kind of exciting. And I don't think you mentioned yours being groundbreaking because we're seeing like women – hire a prostitute and I don't necessarily think like we're beyond the point where it's groundbreaking to be like oh women have sex too like you've seen Magic Mike you've seen Fifty Shades of Grey we've seen even like Girls Trip and stuff like that like we can have PG-13 comedies that also lean into women like having sex with yeah. hot men and that kind of stuff like I just don't think it's nearly as groundbreaking it's, it's not like, necessarily oh, like sex. yeah it's not that I was like it was more groundbreaking but as far as a romantic comedy type style that's something that's not usually in the premise usually if that's the premise it is usually like a girl's trip like a girl's weekend and they're like focusing on it that way but to have it be a romance that starts like that at least puts a different genre that people would view it um in that would be going to see it so i i, I just liked that concept yours it's, it's more comes down to what movie would i rather see and yours sounds like because ben stiller is the director i don't really know how well he's going to pull off the drama drama as a director i think he's a pretty good um, a dramatic actor when he does it but I like him best in comedies and I like his directing style best when he does do comedies like um, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty or whatever that one is I think that's just okay um, playing a little bit more into the dramatic stuff um, and and again I just think mine's a much more entertaining two leads we have very charismatic and people who have done both comedy like comedy movies very well before and Kristen Bell and Channing Tatum and I think they'd have pretty good chemistry together they're both 
obviously attractive people that would in this situation be entertaining to watch. Um, I think he amped up a little bit more, more comedy tinge to it. Um, it fits both my actors very well. And I like the more, it's a simple concept, but I think it is, it leads to a lot of uh, room for comedy and also some romance where you have someone trying to make someone jealous. They're, they're amplifying and over, you know, overdoing it, playing it up to that other person throughout this business conference. You have the strip club scenes, you have Vegas as a setting. Um, to me, I think yours sounds like, like, like a, a fine co romantic comedy. Like it'd be one of those comedies that comes out and you're like, oh, that was, that was all right, whatever. And then I, mine, I think has the potential to be one of those groundbreaking movies where it's like, we put we could, Ben Stiller goes from the comedy guy to all of a sudden being on the map. Like you, you tell me a couple of years ago, the guy who played Jim is going to direct a, two really great horror thrillers in a row and we're going to be waiting for what he does next. Like I would never believe that, but I, I would want to give Ben Stiller that chance. Like he's seen that he can do the dramatic acting and I want to give him a chance to push that and be the next big person that everyone talks about because in, in at least in our movie fan circles, I feel like that's something people always talk about. Like when an actor or a director comes in and totally breaks their type and totally breaks out of their genre and actually pulls it off. So I think if Ben Stiller, I think he could pull it off. And I think when he does, it would be something that we'd all love to talk about. We would suddenly Look, have he, Ben Stiller on our map. Or he, 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 may, he, he may do, like put on a very good performance in your movie, but your movie to me just sounds a little too bland and like reminiscing it's like oh these, these they meet up later in life and it's just kind of a basic romance like you're saying mine sounds like you think mine sounds like a basic romantic comedy it's me it's yours sounds like a romance movie that i've that are on a million times that i've seen um especially like the like older people getting together and that that that's that happens and that's that those movies are already made so in order for it to be groundbreaking ben stiller really has to direct the hell out of it and i don't really trust him to do that necessarily because i haven't really seen him do it um, yet in a dramatic sense he's done dramatic and it's been okay it's been serviceable and he's done comedy and it's been fantastic if you put a little bit more comedy into it i would have been into your movie i think a little more i think he, when he's done drama it's been great like royal tenenbaums is probably his best performance directing well sure but he's shown that he has the talent for the dramatic performance so my, i mean that could lead most of the directing is getting performances out of your actors and i think that he could get that out of himself i, I could i trust that he could get it out, out of the other actress as well it's also putting a whole movie together and blocking the, the and like pacing of it in the scenes and all that. There's a lot more to directing than just getting the performances out. Um, and I think he's shown that he's okay. Like I said, I just think mine lends to a really fun movie, another, a new take on it, um, on pretty woman, other than just having the title and, and having it just be a couple of older people in it. Um, reading a little, I think mine, again, I just think mine sounds like a really fun romantic comedy that kind of, um, would be a, a movie that a lot you could it could be a date night movie it could be a girls movie it could be a um, even a, even a guy's movie that like you know uh, Kristen Bell on that because it's more comedic you can you can push it to a lot of people and I think a lot of people would get enjoyment out of it all right it's been five minutes Johnny do you know where you're where yeah you're I think I know all right um so when this started um, you know, I, I, I kind of flip-flopped a couple times. At first, I was really leaning towards Bobby, and then I started liking Tristan's, and then I was maybe towards Bobby. But as the arguments persisted, it came down to a couple different aspects. At first, I thought Tristan's reminded me of, like, the Heartbreak Kid um, that Ben Stiller was in, which was a truly god-awful movie. The original with Charles Grodin is great. Um, and he play, plays like this very desperate man and he's kind of a scumbag. And then he starts basically cheating on his wife, like on their honeymoon. And then in the Ben Stiller version, it's just like, oh, he married this crazy lady and it just kind of ruins it. But I think Tristan defended it well of saying like it's more of a drama. And I honestly think that helped his pitch because neither of you brought this up. Um, and Bobby's saying that he doesn't trust Ben Stiller as a dramatic director, but Ben Stiller most recently directed a show called um, Escape at Danamora, which is on Hulu, and it's a fantastic drama with Benicio Del Toro and Patricia Arquette um, and Paul Dano. He directed the shit out of that show, and I think I do trust him more as a dramatic director after seeing that. I, know I was worried at first that Tristan would lean more towards like the tone of like a Walter Mitty type movie. Um, and Bobby's, while it started off, 
Um, you know, I liked his cast. By the end of it, it kind of just reminds me of the crappy uh, Overboard remake where they just flipped the genders and it was just like a lazy remake. And that's what Bobby's felt like a little more towards the end there. So personally, I would go with Tristan, even though that's not where I was going uh, to begin the fight. Yeah, so I have the ultimate ruling on this. And I feel like uh, kind of the difference between the pitches is I feel like Tristan's is very... Uh, low floor high ceiling where bobby's is kind of like you know what you're gonna get it's gonna be a kind of pretty decent solid uh movie but i think with the ben stiller like because i i haven't watched the show that johnny talked about but i've you know seen the trailer for it and i've seen people recommend it and i think ben stiller is the one that would push it more towards the higher ceiling and i like tristan's take on it and it was very close and i flipped back and forth like uh johnny did but ultimately i decided to go with uh tristan uh, more dramatic version. Yeah, I'll take it. There we go. Um, all right. Yeah, that was a good fight, though, guys. Yeah, that was, that close was one. That I, I flip flop back and forth. At first, yeah. I was like, "Yeah, Bobby's probably going to win this pitch," and then I started listening to it, and I'm like, "Just to make some good points." And I don't think you know. I I think if he had just immediately brought up the show I talked about that I can never remember how to say Daniel Moore, I think um, that would have really helped, but I, I know that show luckily. So I think mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's what it came down to for me. All right. So okay. Bobby, it's your pick. Um, Let's go with hard target uh, and I'll go first. All right. Hard target. Sure Johnny's got the description and this is his movie. So he will be making yeah. the decision. God damn right. It's my movie. All right, Hard Target uh, was uh, uh, came out in the great year of 1993, which gave us great people like me and Joe. <laughs> um, the director is John Woo, the great John Woo. So there are some dubs. Um, Chance Boudreau, played by uh, JCVD, a sailor skilled in martial arts, is employed to guard Natasha uh, Binder, played by Yancey Butler, as she tracks down her father in... It's a I don't know what the hell that word is. A Vietnam veteran living in New Orleans named Douglas, played by Chuck Fafer or Fairer. They uh, they soon uncover a sinister group of wealthy men who hunt the homeless for sport, paying them ten thousand dollars if they can survive a cross town journey. When Chance discovers that Natasha's father was one of their victims, he decides to destroy the evil hunters. Hard target's pretty fucking sweet, so I'm excited to hear what you guys have to say. <laughs> All right, so um, my hard target is going to be directed by uh, Panos Kosmatos, the director of Mandy, uh, is my director. Um, and my rule is that it's going to be set in an established fictional world, um, which is going to be the Marvel, the world of Marvel. Um, my lead, Nick Cage, is going to be playing Mark Spector. Uh, the main villain in this movie, Wes- Wesley Snipes, is going to be playing Bushman, and Elle Fanning is going to be playing Laura, uh, kind of the girl part that was in the first one. Um, so we never actually see Kingpin, but he's referenced in this movie. So Wilson Fisk, a- a.k.a. the Kingpin, is putting bounties on, on low-level thugs and homeless people in New York for an unknown reason. Um, we kind of get that revealed throughout the movie that he's kind of trying to draw out heroes that he's... that you know, he's heard about to try to have these bounties on their heads. Um, A young woman is the most recent to have a bounty put on her head. Uh, That's Elle Fanning's character. Mark Spector, who is currently homeless and confused because of his many personalities, uh, saves the woman from a bounty hunter and is now involved. The plot now carries carries out kind of similar to Hard Target with him taking down all these different bounty hunters that are taking out, um, you know, everyone with these bounties, uh, as well as we get a lot of crazy trippy things because Moon Knight has so many different personalities. Mark Spector is Moon Knight. Um, and one of his personalities is that like the reason he would be, cause he's very rich, but one of his personalities, he plays out as like a homeless guy a lot of the time in the comics. Um, and that's where he's at right now. And that's where we find him in the beginning of the movie, but we get trippiness where you don't really know what's real and what's in his head. We got to get a lot of re- uh, references to him with Egyptian gods, uh, Bushman's tough and his powers. You, again, it's trippy in the way that you don't know if it's what is actually happening or if it's just what uh mark specter is seeing but that's kind of where the crazy action comes in um and again yeah it plays out like that he goes it's straightforward as far as plot uh very similar to hard target with him taking out these people but we get 
the craziness of Nicolas Cage getting to play a bunch of different personalities. All right. Uh, Tristan, what is your version of Hard Target? So for my Hard Target, I'll start off with the rule that I use, and it was to put a director on the map. And the director that I put on the map is Carl Tibbetts. He directed a, a lot of the really good episodes of Black Mirror, including uh, White Christmas. It was a Christmas special with John Hamm and White Bear. I think both of those are some of the best episodes of uh, Black Mirror. He works on that show a lot. Uh, so it's about an untouchable megacorp called Game who secretly wins a very dangerous game, the hunting of homeless people for a high-priced sport. Uh, my main character is Chance Hernandez, played by Diego Luna. He's a homeless war vet who becomes the target of the newest client. And I have uh, Pike, the main hunter guy, uh, who's kind of leading this charge to take down uh, Diego Luna in time on this game, and it's played by John Bernthal. The owner of the corporation, Jefferson, is played by uh, Ralph Fiennes. And kind of a sleazy trust fund kid, the one who is hit hired on John Bernthal and is wanting to kill Diego Luna for the sport of it, is played by Kieran Culkin. Uh, so I basically have this really just high stakes thrill ride through like an mm -hmm. urban environment. And I think that this director, I wanted to lean a bit into like the sci-fi commentary angle of this premise where it's like this mega corporation who is exploiting homeless people to the point where they're just not even looking at them as people. They're like, oh, we'll just send you as targets to be killed. And I think that's like an exploitation angle that I think a Black Mirror director could be able to bring that commentary into the story while still telling a really good, compelling kind of ride and working in that commentary. Uh, and I, I wanted to give it that slightly larger than life feel that I think Black Mirror has that would go in line with the original hard target. That's obviously not a exactly serious movie. But I think Black Mirror sometimes walks that line between just being fun, especially in the uh, White, Christ White Christmas episode that he directed. It has that line of being dark while also being really fun and knowing, knowing where it is in the world, I think. And I want to just give him that fun kind of action adventure story and have this theme throughout that the house always wins. Like Diego Luna is racing against the clock. He's, he's trying so desperately to just get a single step above this corporation. And like he's spent this entire day working just tirelessly and tirelessly against this unmovable force and then in the end like all he does is survive like he doesn't really make a dent onto this corporation he takes out some of the people involved but they're still standing and they're still working and he he knows that like this battle to take this out is just going to be a long one and that's my pitch for hard target all right I don't really have Joe, any. I'm making, yeah, I was going to say, I'm making the final decision. Do you have any questions? I really don't me? have any questions for either of them. I kind of get a vibe of both of their movies. so. Yeah, I kind of just need both of you to defend in your fights that you repitched a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie with Nicolas Cage and Diego Luna as yeah. your lead. So I need you two to defend why this movie exists if it's not like a badass action movie. So for mine, it is. Are we just starting with the ar arguments right now, or yeah, just oh, okay. arguments? Right, so, okay. So I'll, I'll start with that. At least just defend that. Let Tristan kind of defend it. We can go in. But for mine, it the action comes more in how the directing style, and we have Nicolas Cage who can pull off, especially in a movie that's based around, like you know, Moon Knight as a superhero, where you can kind of have him do a lot of the action without his face. Like you can still do some crazy action in there, and then you get Nicolas Cage's actual performance thrown in where he can do whatever he wants with all these different personalities and all that. So it is still very heavy action. You have Wesley Snipes, who's done plenty of action before, as the main villain uh, who's chasing him down. So I think that it can be pulled off well, and it's it's more trippy action than it is, like, John Wick action, in a, in a sense. Like, it's it's more, um, more a little bit more to, ridiculous than it is, like, he's doing martial arts right, at, you know, on top of these guys. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going for, at least with, with the Moon Knight, with Nicolas Cage's side. Bobby, my one question, too, is just so I can picture the action. Your movie is directed by the guy who did Mandy, but I don't see the violence of Mandy ever being in a Marvel movie. So what it does your what's your movie rated? What's the action look like? Like, how are the deaths? Like, is it PG-13? So that's the, that's the beauty of Moon Knight and what he sees in his head versus what happens in reality. You can imply that there's a 
shit ton of blood and craziness going on and just show weird colors, weird creatures, things that he's seeing that are like godlike really related while he's doing it. Um, that so you can he can still show like, oh, he clearly just ripped that guy's head off, but not but in a way that would almost be like a um the way that the way that like any movie with aliens in it get away with it where they show green blood and then they're all good type of thing and it's pg-13 um same with um transformers you can stab people and cut people's heads off anything that's not a human you're allowed to show just about anything you like so whenever something ridiculous happens it's shown through the perspective of moon knight and what he's seeing okay all right i'll answer the first question when you mentioned why you kind of change the tone a bit on this and i I, the original Hard Target is is inspired by Most Dangerous Game, a very famous book that's been adapted tons and times into this kind of a premise. So I wanted to lean a bit into that original idea of just like this this got one guy against the world and one night kind of this like a survival story. And I, I think the director of Black Mirror has that kind of tone that I want out of something like this. The, the action for me in this movie is sort of like Die Hard style action where it's just one guy just trying to use what's around him to survive in the moment. Like he's He's not, he's, he's trained in combat, but he's not like in a combat situation. He's not armed and that kind of stuff. He has his training and he's just trying to survive the night based on what he can find around him in the city. So that's my kind of action for it. And like I said, I think Black Mirror walks that tone really well between being fun and ridiculous while also having a bit of that drama when they want to, too. So I think they, I want to, I think that director could bring in that kind of fun over the top tone of hard target while still being able to inject that drama that I want out of it too. Okay, so if we're just fighting, uh, fighting it out now, no questions. I think to me, by taking some of the more ridiculous stuff out of it, Tristan, and some of the more like kind of crazy action and turning it into more of a serious sci-fi in a, in a way like Black Mirror, the tone doesn't feel like what I like, like hard target to me necessarily. Like I, I think it, it could be, it does sound more like a, like maybe a Black Mirror type of episode rather than um, like a full-on hard target reboot where it's like, oh, hard target, this is crazy. Where I think mine keeps the ridiculousness and just and changes kind of what ridiculousness is in it a little bit. And you get you get to have kind of in the same tone of a, the, that type of movie with a Nicolas Cage bringing that type of performance that you could get out of him um, where you can have him being something maybe similar to him in Kick-Ass versus him in you know yelling about bees versus him in like anything like in mandy it, it, all those performances at once i think wesley snipes can be perfectly over the top at times and also badass at times which is kind of a bushman's a very weird mercenary character that he could just do whatever you want with him as the villain um and again i just think mine leans a little bit more into what i think hard target should be personally well, I think I try to lead into what Hard Target is, and I think in my casting you can see it too. I have Kiernan Culkin and Ray Fiennes. I think they could have a little bit of a comedic edge, and just the premise alone is ridiculous enough that I feel like they could get some fun out of it. Like just this fact that these this over overpowered corporation that can't be touched is just like hunting on homeless people, and I think that Kiernan Culkin especially could bring the comedy and the ridiculousness out of that. He was in the HBO show Succession where he plays like a somewhat similar role, like a rich kind of privileged guy and he's really funny in that and now you want him to bring that kind of edge into here uh and i also really don't like i think your director choice could be great but not within the world of marvel i when you say pg-13 with that director i immediately am turned off like i want that director to be doing original stuff within his own mind and not be limited by like what disney lets him do in a movie so I what i what made Mandy so great is that it was just like this unhinged unfiltered artistic yeah. energy and what I like, but what I like about bringing someone that has that unfiltered artistic energy into something like, like Marvel is sometimes by putting someone in a box, it makes them be more creative. Um, and when you bring someone with an actual vision into Marvel, like we've seen with maybe Black, with like Black Panther, um, and that like where someone can inject their own flavor and their own style and their messages into it, there's a way to inject that into a Marvel movie and make it one of their better movies and also making it more accessible than something they might do on their own, like a Mandy. And I, th I think that making it putting a little bit of a box so that he doesn't just go, Oh, this is all blood gore guts and craziness and being like, okay, how do I inject my style without doing that? But also I make don't... it fun. And I think that I like that as a challenge. And I like when directors are put into that. 
I just don't think they would pull off. Like, we look at when they were working with uh, Edgar Wright on Ant-Man, and he tried to bring his own style, and he tried to work both sides of the studio and the style choice, and he couldn't that's do a very it. Different situ- that's a very different But that's a very different situation. He was on that movie before the Marvel, the MCU was even established, and the movie that he wrote just didn't fit the movie that they wanted to make at that point. Like, if you're bringing him on right now, they're going to make the movie that they want to make. So and I, I've I think, seen it before where yeah. they take really stylish, like, like Scott Derrickson was an interesting horror director, and they gave him Doctor Strange, and it was just like boring, you know. And I just don't. Marvel does this a lot, where they'll take talented directors, and occasionally we get something like Thor Ragnarok, but most of the time they just give us like stock movies that aren't very interesting and don't really allow the director to be creative. It's almost like they're not even directing the movie themselves. They get shot lists from the studio sometimes. It's not a creative endeavor. It's like a paycheck for a lot of these directors, which is fine, but I just don't think they're going to make the most out of this talented director. And I don't want to see him follow up a great movie in Mandy with some, just another like Marvel movie. All right. It's been cool. five minutes. If you want to keep yeah. going or I, I, I have my decision. Um, but I could be swayed by Joe, depending on what you think of it. Um, so as far as my opinion goes, I feel uh, it's hard. Cause I, neither pitch really sold me all that well. I feel like, I agree kind of with what your initial thing of I think either pitch would have sold me if it was more of a action style yeah. lead. Uh, but I think it I, my thoughts are basically for what Bobby pitched, I'm not a hundred percent sure it would like gel with the Marvel <clears throat> universe as we've seen it. Potentially it could, but I'm just ever slightly leaning towards Tristan, but yeah, um, I I wish in seven that Kevin Spacey turned to Brad Pitt and said sometimes putting someone in a box makes them more creative. Um, I think that would have been a very funny line at the end there. Um, but um, it, yeah, if I'm being honest, <clears throat> I was a little disappointed, uh, kind of by both at first, but one of them sold me by the end. And that's the one that I can see being more of like a modern day Soylent Green type of movie with a more interesting cast, and that's Tristan's. Bobby made a mistake by setting his in the Marvel Universe. I think that was the wrong fictional world to set yours in and then not focus on like the proper hero for this. I mean, if, if even like if you had went more of the direction of like the Shang-Chi or the Eternals type movies that are coming out for Marvel, I would have been more on board with that. But Nicolas Cage, I think, doesn't belong anywhere near a big franchise anymore. Like, I like his small movies that he's doing, and I think he should stick with that. I don't need to see him in another Marvel movie. I don't need to see Wesley Snipes at age 50-something being the villain in a Marvel movie. Um, While I like your director, I don't think he's the right choice for the movie you pitched. I would have liked you to do more of... if you pitched if you had to stick with mcu and you pitched with you know a hawkeye movie or um like an iron fist movie i think those would have been uh more beneficial towards hard target and i think you kind of made a mistake by going like nicholas cage as like an old version of moon knight which we're already getting um a version of moon of moon knight and i think that just was kind of your downfall um so i'm gonna go with tristan even though i'm not completely sold on his pitch i like the idea of uh if you're going to remake Hard Target and you're not going to go straight up action movie, I like the direction that he went with making it more about the sci-fi and um, stuck with a Black Mirror director. So I think Tristan's won me over uh, in the end there. So That's fair. A hill to climb. <laughs> All right, Bobby, yeah, you're in a little bit of a yeah. hole, so you're going to need right. a winger here. Where are we going? Let's go with In the Mouth of Madness. I need one back. So... I'll go, like, yeah, I'll go first on this. Yeah, I'll go first on this. I don't know about you, but I have a long one on this one. Mine's longer than my other ones on this one. All right. Well, but this, it's still, yeah. All right. Well, this is another Johnny movie, so he's still judging this round. So. Yeah. All right. So, In the Mouth of Madness came out in 1994. It's directed by the great John Carpenter. When horror novelist Sutter Kane, um, played by Jurgen Prochnow, goes missing, insurance investigator... John Trent, played by Sam Neill, scrutinizes the claim made by his publisher, Jackson Harglow, played by Charlton Heston, and endeavors to retrieve 
a yet to be released manuscript and uh and a certain the writer's whereabouts ascertain the writer's whereabouts um a comp- <laughs> i was like i don't know if this word is going to finish the sentence accompanied by the novelist editor linda styles played by julie carmen and disturbed by nightmares from reading kane's other novels trent makes an eerie nighttime trek to a supernatural town in new hampshire okay all right so to start out um, my director is Alex Garland for this movie, um, which leads into my rule that I'll get into. But my lead uh, is going to be played by John Cho. Uh, and he is like kind of the insurance agent guy that I will get into. Um, the, the Because I'm changing from an author to a director, uh, that character is going to be played by Colin Farrell. Um, then another main character that I'll get into in this is going to be played by Sonia Mizuno, who is in, a, in Devs and Ex Machina, uh, that... Alex Garland works with a lot. So this film starts out at a funeral showing our main character, John Cho's character. Um, and one of his childhood friends had recently died, but the family's not saying exactly what happened. Um, he works for a film insurance team that uh, assesses risks on movie sets and if they qualify for insurance. He's called to work on a famous director's new film. He's kind of the James Cameron type who takes years and years between his movies, but always pushes the boundaries of technology. He starts to recognize people in the town um, as people he knows from his life, which is very confusing and starts to drive him mad. So we kind of get in this town that that they're shooting the movie and the director kind of took it over and everyone, every single person in it, this guy going into it knows for, for whatever reason. Um, he reaches his breaking point when he sees his friend whose funeral he attended at the beginning, being, beginning of the movie. That was Sonoya Mizuno. So now they start to work together to try to figure out exactly what is going on because she doesn't remember dying. Um, so he, uh, by the end through all these investigation and, and talk with the director uncovers that he is essentially trying to, um, unlock the, um, goal, the, and unlock the achieve eternal life through AI. So everyone in this town is an AI. Um, after it's revealed, we get, you know, the insurance guy saying he's going to reveal this and all this type of stuff. And the, and the director also offers him an ultimatum saying, look, if you try to leave, you're going to die, um, or you can stay and you can be the star of this movie that I'm making. We cut to the end, um, and we see that he is in the theater, just like the original movie where we have Sam Neill in the theater watching the movie that he's starring in. He's watching, he is the star of the movie, and um, we get kind of him, it's kind of kind of dead-faced as he's watching it, no reaction, and we're a little, we're unsure if he is, himself or if he was replaced by an ai so that's my open-ended ending all right and uh tristan what is your pitch for in the mouth of madness at first i want to give a shout out to hayden christensen who made a little appearance in the original mouth of madness you know my guy uh he i'm gonna go with the same role that bobby used just to set you guys up i'm gonna have an open ending but i went with the director that i think is a little bit a better choice for what I'm going for in mine. And it's Lawrence Michael Levine, who directed Black Bear recently. Uh, I thought that was a really great movie that kind of walked the line between real reality and fiction and blend, blurred this line of like, oh, what is artistic intent versus... He, just, he was able to capture like the statement of the, the vibe between the art and the artist and that kind of stuff. So I want to I want to lead into the themes of the original of like this insanity between the art and the artist and... I'll go into a little bit more as I go along. Uh, my main uh, character here is played by Lakeith Stanfield, and he's playing the Sam Neill role similarly to the first one, but in this one he's a studio producer who's assigned to work on this movie. My secondary lead is Alison Brie, who's the lead actress of the movie. And my third character is film director Sutter Kane, played by Willem Dafoe. Uh, so we have Sutter Kane, who's sort of an elusive cult film director. Uh, he, In his early career, he made a movie that was critically acclaimed and called like, oh, this is one of the greatest movies of all time. This is going to be one of the greatest working directors of all time. And then after that, he was never able to follow it up. He just kind of ended up making a lot of like slocky sci-fi B movies and stuff that was kind of decried as like nonsense by critics and ended up just kind of falling into irrelevancy and, and dropping off the radar. But after dropping off the radar, he kind of develops like this big 
cult following around him and his bad movies and that oh they're not actually bad there's got to be some secret meaning behind them for why they're bad because clearly this great director couldn't have just suddenly started making bad movies there's got to be some deeper reason behind that and this kind of following builds up around him over the years of is what are these guys movies like and there's this rumor building up of like oh he has this he's really been off working on this one final great uh, script that's going to be like his ultimate return to quality as a filmmaker so he suddenly announces oh i do i'm making that final script i want this actress called named ally who is played by allison Bree, to be my lead she's uh, shocked by this because she's not really an experienced actress. She's been in a bit part in small roles here and there, and, and then suddenly she's chosen to be the lead of this big, highly anticipated movie, and she's not quite sure right, quite sure why. And like I said, Lakeith Stanfield is also there. He's a studio producer who's kind of assigned to make sure this movie actually comes to be and happens. But the day the production is set to begin, Kane vanishes. No one really knows where he went. He just leaves kind of a vague note in his path with some quotes from his movies and not much else to go off of. So they kind of just assume, like, oh, this is the director. I guess he's gone. And the studio is trying to decide, oh, should we bring on someone to replace him and get this movie done because it was very expensive and we have all these casts here. And Ali is distraught because this was going to be her big break. This is what was going to put her on the map. was what was going to give her, like, meeting. And now suddenly this guy is gone. There's got to be a reason that he left. So she's, she's reading the note over and over again. And she's convinced there's got to be a meaning in these movies. That's why he used these quotes. So she's watching the movies over and over and over again every night, just slowly but surely losing her grip on on sanity because she needs these movies to have some meaning. And she notices that right around the point that the quotes from the letter are said, this Im these images come by on the screen, like something like Tyler Durden did in Fight Club, like this, these sing single frame images that are just a bunch of mysterious kind of letters and, and signs, and she's not sure what it means. So she prints them all out and brings them to Lakeith well, Stanfield's character and says, help me figure out what's going on. And that's what brings our characters kind of together to go on this adventure where they take all of these uh, different images and different lines and put them together on the table and realize it's spelling out a map leading them somewhere. So they follow this map and it brings them to a small town where they find Sutter Kane is living there among a bunch of his uh, followers and people who clearly were uh, inspirations for some of his characters, his movies, and he's there working as just kind of a small town bookstore owner and claiming, oh, I'm not Southern King, I've never directed a movie before in my life, I don't know what you guys are talking about, I've been in this town my whole life, and we get that kind of trippiness of this of this guy, is, is he really telling the truth, is he, uh, is he lying, is he hiding from the responsibility of making this movie, is he correct under the pressure, that kind of ambis ambiguousness, and towards the end of the movie, uh, Alice and Brie and uh, they're having she's having this final uh, conversation with with Sutter Kane, and she kind of breaks into his bookstore and is looking around, and she finds the script of what would have been in the mouth of madness, the movie that she was going to star in. That was her big break, and we see her read through the script and be kind of horrified and she runs to Lakeith Stanfield's character and shows it to him and the script is essentially a breakdown of the movie we've already seen you know it's about an actress and a producer whose director goes missing and they trace him down and even like some of the intimate scenes where they connect his characters like some of their lines directly are in the script and it breaks her kind of like shatters her mind to like oh god how, how are all of these moments and these scenes from my life part of this movie and they all kind of flee, but in the final scene, we get Lakeith Stanfield's character returning to this town after some amount of time, and we see that Allison Brie is now living in this town among these people, claiming she was never an actress before, and that she's just been in this town. And to get that open-endedness of, like, are they serious? Is something happening to their brains? Like, what's going on with these people? And that's just kind of my, my pitch for Manoa of Madness, a movie that examines the complexity of art in its relationship to the artist, in relationship to the fandom, and people trying to make meaning out of nothing, and ultimately just an open ending that is all about that. All right, I feel like both of you knew I was um, picking this one <laughs> because you both, uh, with Alex Garland, the director of Black Bear, and your cast, I feel like you guys pandered to me a little bit. So I'm interested to see if Joe has any questions for you. 
Yeah, I don't know what the I I probably I don't even know what the hell the original movie was about. I, I don't know. <laughs> I've seen it and I barely know what it's about. I've been confused for the last ten minutes, so <laughs> I have questions, but we we'll, this is a two hour show and my questions would take a solid four or five hours, so <laughs> We'll just um, let Johnny control this round, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you have somebody who knows the movie. The, yeah, I kind of got the vibe of Tristan's. It's um, like a psychological thriller and stuff like that. Bobby, is yours? Um, I know you kind of went into this in your pitch, but is yours um, delve more into like the Alex Garland like sci-fi uh, and psychological thriller? Yeah, type of it's feel? more like more like the ex machina style because a lot of it is investigation and interviewing people and trying to figure out what is going on because as soon as he gets there because he's trying to assess everything to make sure it's safe but then he's like wait why is everyone here someone from my life why do i know everyone here which also implies later that by the way everyone is dead that he knows essentially so that's all also a dark thing that goes into the thriller aspect but yeah it's a lot of you know, what the hell is going on with reveals throughout the movie slowly pushing you towards kind of what the director is really getting at and what he's doing. Coming down to that final ultimatum where it's like, all right, I've recorded all of this and this is my movie. You're either going to agree to star in it um, and leave this all alone or you're going to die, basically, you know. And then you get the open end because you don't know what he chose. You don't know it, but he's watching it in the theater like in the original. So it very much is, it leads into a kind of, you know, ending that is a little more crazy because all the ai start to turn on him as soon as he is more questioning and saying that he's going to reveal it all and all this type of stuff so we get more of the amp up of ex machina i would say okay all right well with that being said i don't really have any other questions and joe's lost in the sauce over there so yeah a little bit let's, I don't know. Uh, let's uh let's hear your guys fight. yeah there's five minutes on the clock and i can at least pay attention to that so yeah tristan i think you have a couple you have like multiple open ending type things at the end of it i thought you were ending with the director happening and then you have another ending where like she's in the town and i feel like it leads it's just like a it's a little too much i feel like you went into a lot of different um aspects that would be like like again it would feel like multiple endings to me it just felt like you were ending your pitch multiple times so i don't know it just it didn't come quite come together um and i feel like mine is more it starts out so grounded and and builds and builds and builds and it's going to increase the tension ratchet it up and increase and get a lot of the confusion because of you know him knowing all these people i, I think i can picture my movie being a little bit more um straightforward for most of it and then you get that ending it's like okay what the fuck just happened whereas yours is like I don't quite know well, what if you've happened. Seen, if you've seen Blackberry, you know that the movie is still very segmented. Like, there's multiple parts where, like, a storyline comes to a head and ends, and then we start, like, a, almost like a different storyline. And I want to kind of capture that here, too, where he's wandering through kind of multiple different storylines and multiple different characters. And Blackberry's very ambiguous by the end. Like, you don't quite know the line of reality and what uh, what of these scenes is real, what of these scenes is not, which of these characters is real, which of them is not. And it doesn't feel bogged down by the questions like you don't really get any answers by the end but i feel like that's part of the entertainment and i wanted to go for that here i think yours sounds like you said it sounds straightforward and i don't in the mouth of madness is nothing but like it straightforward is not a word i used to describe mouth of madness and i think that my director captures that a little bit better than yours and my movie does too. well i mean straightforward in the sense that you will actually like you'll be able to at least follow even if you don't know what's going on you're going to be able to follow the movie what i meant with yours it kind of just felt all over the place with mine um you you get a lot of what the hell is going on and it's like you you are confused but you're following what the main character is confused by the whole time so it's open-ended in that sense for a lot of it um and it's pretty straightforward with the characters i mean the director goes missing they're trying to figure out why and allison Bree's noticing these weird symbols like this their storyline is pretty straightforward up until the very very end when allison Bree's story has a twist but i think their mm -hmm. through line is pretty straightforward but everything around them yeah. is just increasingly bizarre and surreal yeah and i still have the increasingly bizarre and surreal in mind with with all the stuff that's happening with the ai in this town i don't know i it, it i think it kind of comes down to what type of movie you what style of movie you would prefer for this type of of remake um because i it, it's kind of hard to fight because i can't quite picture your entire movie i but um i like the fact that you start with okay you have in my movie 
it's established that this character is dead. So you don't need a lot of exposition in order to set up the fact that of exactly what's like, once he gets there, why he's so confused and why he's so, you know, and go, driving himself mad through this. I don't know. I, it's just, again, this movie is mad is, is madness. The original in the mouth of madness is, is crazy. I think trying to put it at least a little bit more straightforward, but still have the bizarre elements in it would be the way I would want to see it because I think Carpenter went a little too far personally in the original with it, with what he was going for. Two minutes. Um, and mine bottles up all of that bizarreness into a sci-fi angle that I prefer and that I like and adds a thriller kind of investigative aspect, which I think would make it, you really connect with the lead instead of going the more bizarre turn like you're going, I guess. I just think mine's much more in tone with the original movie. And I think what makes this movie worth watching really is just the bizarreness of it and how how surreal uh, he gets with the direction. And especially compared to like his work in something like Halloween that's very straightforward and very like intentionally coldly shot. And this is not that. This is like such a creative but, output. And I think- But that's not something I would want to, I, that's not something I would want to recapture. This is such a once in a, you know, director's career type of movie. He does all the craziness and bizarre stuff. Trying to replicate that, I don't think is necessarily the way to go, but I think the story is great. And I think if you can tell that story and have elements of the crazy and the bizarre, but bottle it into the sci-fi type thing, in, instead of trying to replicate the craziness of Carpenter, um, I think that leads to a more interesting movie uh, nowadays, personally. And I'm not trying to replicate Carpenter. I'm definitely making this in the style of my director. He, and he's using the elements and the language that Carpenter kind of established. But it, this feels, uh, my movie is feeling very much like he's the work in Black Bear. And I wanted to make this similar to Black Bear and its structure and let him go a little bit more wild with it. Because he showed some inclinations toward the surreal in Black Bear. And I want to give him a chance to really let that out and let that loose and see what it's going to be. I also think Mike has some interesting meta commentary with like this director who made one really really great movie and then like slowly fell into shock later on in his career and i think that could be something that is relevant to even carpenter in the original movie like this director who made some great stuff and then slowly but surely fell off and i think especially because my director is like a sophomore director it would be he's on this pressure of like how do i follow up my great debut and that would be something to bring into the movie too i just think there's a lot of really fascinating meta elements that play into my movie that i think add to the surrealness like the fact that Allison Breeze playing an actress named Allie who's waiting for her big dramatic break. And I think there's just stuff that connects to our own minds and kind of makes the audience lose, start to question ourselves and be like, oh, wait, what was that true? Was that not true? And I think mine just keeps the audience on the edge of the seat a lot more in terms of throwing you for a loop and not quite help letting you understand what you're seeing. All right, it's been five minutes. I don't know if you need to hear more. I think I have my decision made. Um, Joe, I know <clears throat> you were obviously very confused by everything happening. Pretty but, much. Uh, if you had to pick one, what what do you think you would lean towards, or can you not even decide? I don't. Like <clears throat> the thing is, I kind of understood Tristan's more, but I think that's more because I heard Bobby's pitch before it, so it let me kind of understand uh, what I was in for by the time I got to Tristan's pitch, or if I think Tristan pitched first, I would be like, okay, I understand Bobby's more. If that makes any kind Thank of sense. Thank you for your uselessness, <laughs> Joe. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I went back and forth again on this one. Um, it's tough because I like Bobby's cast, except I don't really get the John Cho casting at all um and i like tristan's cast but i'm not like super familiar with allison brie outside of community and a couple like smaller roles she's had in a couple um movies so i haven't really seen any yeah. of her dramatic work H if she's have you seen it. have you seen searching johnny with john show because that's why i went with him okay no, he's he's very good and dramatic and plays the he's investigating why his like daughter is missing and he's like yeah. I've pretty much only seen John Cho and Harold and Kumar and Got the it. bad Star Trek movies. So that's not not um, what I was going for. Yeah, but I know he was in like the Exorcist show, and I know he's done more dramatic stuff. So I, I guess I get it. But yeah, it's tough. I went back and forth. I think Tristan's ending. Hmm. 
You know what? I'm going to go with this. Now, I can only go based on... I think both of your pitches are about equal. I think both of your casts kind of cancel each other out. So I have to go with kind of the combination of who used the rule better and which director I like more. And I love both directors. Black Bear was maybe my favorite movie of last year. Um, and it's a shame that it wasn't nominated for anything. But I do think the strongest aspect of Black Bear was the lead performance and not so much like I watched Black Bear and I didn't spend... 30 minutes afterwards trying to figure out what I just watched. It was like, oh, I like that a lot. And then I didn't need to have a conversation with someone about it. Whereas Alex Garland, when I watched Debs and when I saw Annihilation, like Bobby and I spent the entire, like we talked about the open ending of Annihilation for about 45 minutes in the cold Michigan parking lot uh, of Imagine Theaters when we when we saw it. So I think if I'm just going to go based on what would be more of the open ending based on what I've seen from both of them do, what's going to make me like sit there and really have to delve into what I think about this, just based on the work of Alex Garland, I think that kind of gives Bobby the, the, uh, the lead here, but it was super close. I, I think I changed my mind like halfway through making my decision because I was going back and forth so much and Joe's was this over there. So um, Bobby, hey, I, I said I, were, I don't even remember. You right, stayed so. alive. Uh, Stay alive. Yeah, I needed that. that. Yeah, you needed a win, and you barely edged it out. But that was really close. So I'm uh, excited to see then with oh, Tristan okay. if he can uh, take back his major lead with our next choice. I'm gonna go with uh, the Page Master from 1994. All right, so that is oh, right. Johnny and I's movie together. So. Yeah, movie. Yeah. Bobby can go first. You know, I'll go first on this one. I'll go first on this one. All right. Yeah, I think I've gone first the last two times. Yeah. Just don't make it too know. confusing or Joe will be lost. <laughs> um, then it'll, it'll, he'll understand mine. So, yeah. This one should be pretty straightforward here. The Page Master came out in 1994. Um, it was directed by Maurice Hunt and Joe Johnston. And the description is, a storm forces frightened Richard Tyler, played by Macaulay Culkin, inside a nearby library for shelter. Mr. Dewey, played by Christopher Lloyd, the librarian, sees that Richard needs an adventure and tries to give the boy a book. But all Richard wants is a phone. Before he can call his parents, Ed Begley Jr. and Mel Harris, I don't know why it needs to tell me who his parents are. I don't even remember them being in the movie. Richard <laughs> slips on the floor, hits his head, and passes out. When he wakes up, he finds himself in his fantasy land populated by famous literary characters. I think this movie is one that's perfect for a reboot because the, um, I think the actual plot is great, but I think the movie was not executed very well, yeah. even though I liked it when I was a kid. So I'm excited to see if you guys can improve upon the original version in your pitches. Uh, I'll, I'll get to my my first. director and writer in a second, but I'll I'll say that my rule is that I set this in an established universe, which is the DC universe. Uh, so while stuck in a storm, oh, man. Uh, overnight, uh, in in Gotham City, nerdy outcast Tyler takes shelter in a comic book shop run by Mr. Dewey, who I have played by Kevin Conroy. Uh, the two bond over comics and discuss the real world hero of Batman who patrols the streets of Gotham. Tyler talks about he how he thinks Batman is like really interesting and he always thought that he as a uh, is, I am played by Jacob Tremblay he's a young kid so he's been always wanting to kind of look up to Batman he wants to be like a Robin of this universe and he's just saying oh I wish I could fight alongside Batman so when Tyler goes to sleep he wakes up in an animated dream world set in the world of Batman the animated series uh, so my writer and director is Bruce Tim. I also brought back Paul Dini and Mitch Bryan who are the co the creators and writers of Batman the Animated Series to write this. So Tyler wakes up and he's in Batman the Animated Series. Uh, he's in a comic book shop being attacked by the Mad Hatter. Uh, he's rescued by Robin and Batgirl. And for most of these characters, you bring back the actors who voiced them in Batman the Animated Series. Uh, and Batman, Robin and Batgirl kind of question why Mad Hatter would be after this random kid. And they decide, let's take him to Batman and Batman could probably figure it out. So we come and we meet Batman in the darkness of the Batcave, voiced by Kevin Conroy, and I wanted to have that be 
because in the dream logic, maybe he's just dreaming that Mr. Dewey, the guy that is helping him, is Batman, you know, because it's also Kevin Conroy. So Batman uses the Bat uh, Cave tech to scan Tyler and determine that he's not from their world and that he is, in fact, still asleep. So Batman uh, determines that the Mad Hatter uh, put Tyler to sleep in his world, leaving him here in his dream. Uh, it's similar to a Batman the Animated Series plot where the Mad Hatter uh, traps Bruce Wayne in a dream where he wakes up and it's like his parents never died and everything is kind of good for him. So I wanted to reference that here by using the same villain. Uh, and Mad Hatter is essentially draining Tyler and his world of their energy to keep uh, his machines and his, uh, his stuff alive in the Batman the Animated Series uh, universe. And kind of in the background throughout this, we're building up Joker as a villain uh, who is going to show up kind of at the end and he delivers this line like if the whole world is dream kid then you're not waking up and that of course Mark Hamill would voice the Joker so in the end Batman and the crew kind of battle to defeat the Mad Hatter and in the, at this point like he's been working alongside Batman and he's kind of getting this like wishful of being the of being Batman's sidekick in the animated universe uh, and the tech is all kind of destroyed and Tyler is sucked through into uh, his own world. He wakes up back in the live action world for this for the last sequence here. And he's gained this new confidence. He stands up to the Mad Hatter and, and kind of holds his own for a second to get out of the store and run. And as he's fleeing out of the store in the street, uh, Batman swoops down from the top of the building. It's Robert Pattinson's Batman who defeats the Mad Hatter and takes him away and just kind of gives a nice nod to Tyler. Like, Tyler knows so much about Batman now, and he finally gets a chance to meet the real-world Batman of Robert Pattinson in this quick little scene at the end, and that's my pitch for Page Master. All right. Bobby, I hate that that's pitch. A, that's the direction. I feel like, Bobby, you went with a very similar thing based on his reaction to your pitch. So, Bobby, what do you got for us, comic book land over there? All right, so I'll, to start, um, my rule is I'm going to put a director on the map. Uh, the director I chose is Martin Krejci, who did The Adventures of Wolf Boy, uh, which is a very uh, good um, coming-of-age movie with some vis very good visuals, I would say. Um, the star of my movie is McKenna Grace, who you've seen in The Gifted and Itania, a little bit older than the uh, original Page Master. She's about, I think, 13 or 14. Um, and my comic book store owner is going to be played by Mark Hamill. Just so you know. <laughs> Should have been um, Kevin Conroy. Yeah, but... So I didn't have as much of as as much of a plot as Tristan described, but again, it it is similar. Where we have uh, McKenna Grace's character is this very kind of anxious, um, nervous kind of teenage girl who's not quite coming to her own, um, doesn't quite have her confidence, and she lives her life in these worlds, these like supernatural, these, like movies and and video games and comic books and that type of stuff. So same type of thing where she enters this comic book store, um, and the whole beginning of the premise happens again where she falls asleep after talking with the comic book store owner Mark Hamill and all that stuff and wakes up in the world of comics. Now the one thing that is different is that instead of being in, in just one world and one set thing, these are because it is um, not necessarily like this is Batman, they are all different styles of comic books. So she's going to be jumping between superhero styled comic books, horror styled comic books, Japanese mangas, um, and different types of books, just like the first one, where you go into different things and get characters along the way. Um, and you have Mark Hamill being able to do uh, a few different voices, as long as, as as well as just other people that are voicing. I didn't cast other voices, but um, you get her showing up in each world, growing more and more confident with each place that she's in. And she brings a character with her along the way to each story. So she goes into the superhero world first, which would be like kind of the entrance point that people know of with comic books brings along the sidekick uh, character along to the next story once she is able to follow the villain in through there um, and, and wakes up in a Japanese um, manga, which is like a lot more crazy and bizarre and weird things happening in there. Uh, and then finally ends up in a horror one. And the horror one, which should be the scariest one, is where she is now the most confident um, and is able to kind of show the, the progress that she's made throughout the movie uh, by the time she wakes up back in the comic book store she wakes up and has all three of the different books that she's been in um and asks if she can buy all three and leaves and shows a much more of a confident stride than she did in the beginning of the movie all right all right well that was an interesting pitch um 
to give right. you some insight here, Joe texted me, as long as Bobby doesn't botch this, do they need to debate? And I said, no, I hate Tristan. <laughs> so, um, so I think that kind of tells you where we're at. But I'll, um, Joe, why, why, why was Tristan so bad? I mean, it was to me his story outside of the world of the Page Master. I don't know if necessarily his pitch was bad, but one of the things I was looking for in a Page Master like story in that is I want like these characters from these different worlds all like coming together and stuff. And I just don't know if yeah. it had more from the DC universe than just kind of the Batman and his like the world of Gotham. I think it would have been more into it. But then one of my other problems with it is. Uh, the Mad Hatter in a lot of comics, especially recently, has been depicted as a pedophile. So having the main like kid character just like knocked out with the Mad Hatter there the entire movie, I'm going to have thoughts of like, is this kid just getting, you know, having an inappropriate situation yeah, right now? Yeah, is this, this kid's <laughs> escape when he's being like molested by the Mad Hatter? Um, but I will yeah, say, no, I... normally... I will say if we want, we can give Tristan one minute to kind of more go over his pitch and see if it would lead us to a fight. But right now, I'll, I'll just say this because I don't think we need that. I'm not going to change my mind. I think anytime you use the rule of like, oh, you have to use a DC villain or set one in a fictional world. All that's supposed to do is make a movie and then include that rule. Don't make the whole movie surrounded by that universe. Like you could have done it as comic books like Bobby did, but I don't need to see this set in the DC and be so focused on it. Bobby made the mistake of doing his super, in the DC super Marvel things, but I don't know. I mean, the, the rule is set one in an established fictional world. You could have done it in DC and not tied it to Batman so heavily, um, but I think both you and Bobby fell into the trap of, of making your movie like Bobby made his in MCU and you made Robert Pattinson in yours and all this. And I, I think when you do those, um, I mean, I lost the pitch, but it reminds me of Bobby's Beverly Hills Cop. And I think anytime someone does like, you know, oh, I need a DC villain. And then it's like, oh, but I'm going to make every character DC and do this and do that. And I think those pitches are always weak for me. So those are never going to win me over. Um, but I do think uh, if Tristan's was like an animated movie and it went on HBO Max, like I would watch it. Bobby's just sounds more, yeah, like Joe said, I think the main, the main thing is, the whole point of the page master is you see these different literary characters interacting in different worlds. And I would like to see either of you establish that more. Um, Bobby at least stuck with like different kind of comic books. And uh, I think Tristan just focused too heavily on, on Batman. I actually so said I in the established different. universe. So it was my bad, I guess. Yeah, you, you did. Because I was trying not to make you guys do just another MCU and DC thing by making it a fictional world. It could have been, anything and then both of you just went to the well and i was disappointed by the rule overall so that ties it up um okay so we're gonna go with uh tristan what do you got next you gotta get your lead back let's go with steady slickers hopefully you guys don't complain that i use the rule that was a all right to the episode all right that was my movie so i will be judging i mean i'm movie. not complaining about your your rule usage it's just the lack of creativity so let's go with uh city slickers Came out in 1991, the directed by Ron Underwood. Um, every year, three friends take a vacation away from their wives. This year, Henpecked Phil, played by Daniel Stern, newly married Ed, played by Bruno Kirby, and Mitch, played by Billy Crystal, terrified of his midlife crisis, decide to reignite their masculinity by taking a supervised cattle drive across the Southwest. Under the supervision of gruff cowboy Curly, played by Jack Palance, the men set out on a journey that turns unexpectedly dangerous. The three men bond along the way to conquering their fear of aging. All right. I don't remember that being the plot, and I saw this movie. <laughs> I mean, that's the general message, but it's not. Yeah. It's very loose. Yeah. Tristan, what, who's going first? Uh, Bobby can go first on this All right. one. All right. Um, so the rule I chose is that this is going to star and be directed by Ben Stiller. Um, so therefore, one of my stars is Ben Stiller. The other two leads in the movie are Chris Rock and Kumail Nanjiani. Um, I also have people on the farm are going to be played by um, Robert Downey Jr., Owen Wilson, and Taika Waititi. So 
I, I started out very similar where Ben Stiller is going through the midlife life crisis and wins a trip to Texas um, uh, in, on what is listed as a farm resort. Uh, Chris Rock and Pamela Nanjiani are going through their own issues, uh, including uh, Chris Rock's marriage and Camille Nanjiani um, in a job crisis of whether he should stay or leave and try to do his own thing. Um, their, their farm resort, when they get there, is run by Robert Downey Jr.'s character in an unrecognizable role, kind of similar to Tom Cruise in Tropic Thunder. So going to kind of put him in a weird kind of suit and have him play this very southern um, crazy farm owner. Uh, there Again, it plays out kind of where there's the ridiculous comedic moments that show the differences between the city um, and how people work maybe down south compared to the city, but also the differences in politics down there. Uh, but in in comedic ways, Taika Waititi's character uh, works there and becomes their friend, but kind of slyly tricks them into doing his own tasks for him. Owen Wilson plays like a cowboy kind of wrangler guy um, on the farm as well. Um, they they at the end they come to accept their lives and realize what they have and return back to the city. But the the more change is that it's gonna it's gonna amp up the comedy more like Tropic Thunder style comedy where it's parodying a lot of um, like not necessarily parodying, but it's commenting on a lot of like working class stuff between the South and like the city, like New York, where they're going to come from or, and also, but also the politics. So it's going to show kind of the good and bad of, of both areas um, through like ridiculous moments between, you know, Ben Siller, Chris Crock, Camille Nanjiani, and then uh, a lot of Owen Wilson and Takeaway TV. And then Robert Downey Jr. Is, is in it just about as much as Tom Cruise is in like Tropic Thunder, where he shows up in like crucial moments uh, as the head of it, and it's just kind of ridiculous. So there's my movie. All right. Uh, Tristan, what is your pitch for City Slickers? So for my movie, I gender swapped. Uh, that was my rule. I gender swapped the uh, leads. So it's going to be like a girl's trip essentially out to. Uh, the, to reclaim their youth and I brought on director Malcolm D. Lee who did the literal girls trip which I thought was a really good kind of fun comedy and my cast here I have Kate Winslet Michelle Pfeiffer that's like a mother daughter duo of Kate Winslet as this kind of buttoned up attorney who's living what should be her dream job but she's kind of not really fulfilled by it and Michelle Pfeiffer is like her kind of more wild mom who's like this free living kind of hippie type and there are two friends that go on the ship with them are Selma Hayek and Halle Berry. So my premise is that uh, Jane, the main character, finds out that her ho her home, her old childhood home from down in the South Texas when she grew up as a kid is going to be demolished and rebuilt as an apartment building. So her mom and her friends convince her to go on this last second road trip to buy out this house and to kind of uh, save her childhood metaphorically, but to, she's made all this money working as a New York attorney. So she says, I'm going to go down and I'm going to buy this house and we're all going to go together and make it a trip out of it. So we get this bonding uh, comedy. I think that Girls Trip was like that too. It was like these women who were just uh, slightly out of their like mid-20 prime and they were trying to recapture that a little bit. And I think this show, as people who are starting to hit their midlife or older and they're starting to question uh, their kind of direction in their life and what they've done with their life and their time here so we get a road trip comedy with them uh just kind of fun character interactions they're going from town to town stopping in these small town bars and meeting all these different people and we get the kind of clashing of cultures of these new york kind of elites who are going down into the into the south and clashing with this different world that they're not quite used to but quite kate winslet has this history there of growing up as a kid there so she has this a bit of identity crisis of like oh i was i was like these people now i've totally lost myself uh so in the towards the end there's uh to the classic like falling out scene where the, the women have this fight and they've now lost all the money having to bail them out of jail because of the previous scene where i skipped that paragraph but they get in this kind of bar fight scene with these uh guys that are very much throwbacks to the original characters from the first movie like these kind of uh similar to the Billy Crystal characters and those kind of guys who are out doing a similar thing as them, like the guys who are just kind of trying to reclaim their youth and pick up women. Uh, so anyway, the women are all kind of separated and they don't have their money anymore. So Jane arrives at her former home 
in the final scene and has this kind of moment where she begs him like oh can i just go in and say goodbye can i see the home one last time and she gets like this heartstring tugging moment towards the end where she's walking through her old childhood home and seeing little touches like oh the crayon on the door hinge where we were measuring our height when i was a kid and like oh my childhood bedroom was right here and my first kiss was right here and she's getting these kind of reflections of her childhood and she walks out ready to watch the house be destroyed and as she's standing there her friends pull up and they've kind of pulled their money together and they say look we got the money we can buy the house we're good and she says you know what no we're let's let them destroy it and then the final scene is just kind of like the bulldozer destroying this house as the women drive back home to the city kind of learning to grow and connect and let go of their past and move forward and that's my pitch for city slickers all right all right joe you're making the final decision on this do you have any questions uh, I got Bobby's down. Uh, I don't really have a question for him. My question for Tristan is, is the Michelle Pfeiffer, the mom role, is she with them on the trip or? Yeah, she's with them on the trip. Cause one of the, one of the questions I had was like, as you have the whole dynamic of their, like these city women and they explore the country. If like she, if she lived in that house, like while Kate Winslet was growing up, is there more of dynamic where she's more of like the country type or is she also kind of transitioned to be more? city she's she's more of the country type but even she's lost that touch a bit and we're getting that out of her like she she was that kind of country uh hard talking kind of woman she has the edge a little bit still but now she's like a new york hard talker and she's not quite the same and she's trying to reclaim her youth herself in her own way all right uh johnny do you have any questions Um, for them yeah my, my main question for um so tristan your your director is malcolm d lee who did girl strip correct Mm -hmm. so um Tonally, I expect it to be similar to like a kind of a goofball comedy like Girl Strip, which I did think was fantastic. But Kate Winslet's never done anything like that in her career. She's always been in like very heavy dramas. You look at what she's doing on TV right now with Mayor of uh, Easttown. She was in Eternal Sunshine and Revolutionary Road and all these serious dramas. I've never seen her. Yeah, Titanic. I've never seen her. I have no idea if she's her for your lead. The straight. I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit towards yeah. the end, but I'll I'll say that uh, I use Kate Winslet as a lead because she's going to play like the straight man kind of type. Or like I said, she's this buttoned up attorney who's like very that's right, by that's the numbers right. and kind of that. And she had I could I'm sure she could pull off some comedic moments. She's had comedic moments even in uh, Mayor of Easttown. She has a little bit of some funny parts in there. So I would like to see her as this kind of over and over her head anxious attorney who's in this totally new environment to her. Cool. Yeah, that answers my question. The, the part that broke up was, does she play the more of the straight man? And you answered that immediately. So perfect. That kind of gives me the idea of, uh, of what your movie is like. So I like that. Um, all right. Well, Joe's making the final decision. You guys got about five minutes. Yeah. Let's uh, let's hear them. Let's hear them fight. Yep. All right. You can start, Tristan. What I like about mine is that it, it goes into that theme that Johnny mentioned of like trying to reclaim your youth and being afraid of aging, but without taking it too seriously. Like Johnny said, Drill Strip is very much a ridiculous kind of comedy, and I want to lean to that screwball stuff. And you have that slight little heart tug at the end where you had that like emotional turnaround of a romantic comedy where it's like, oh yeah, there's this little, little bit of a heartstring, and I think you could pull that off. And I think it would be a really cool image, just like the house being destroyed. And I think it gives them a cool motivation to go on this road trip. I think I did more than just change out the genders and do the same thing too. Like I really leaned into like this idea of aging and especially in women, I think when women start to age, they get especially anxious about it because society judges them so much more intensely on how they look and what their age is, age is and that kind of stuff. And all these actresses are starting to hit that part where like they're no longer like the young, hot, attractive actress anymore, you know, and they're more of like the mom character in movies. <laughs> so I think it would be interesting to see them explore that within this comedy too. I think mine sounds like a lot of fun. It also sounds good as a, a good little change of heart there for it. Yeah, and my my only flaw with that would like as far as like choices with some of your acting and directing is that is you're taking the the director of Girls Trip and making another women road trip movie, and I'd like to see them kind of step out of their their box to do something a little different because we've seen them do that really well before. Um, so you're doing the exact same type of comedy. Um, and then you have leads that aren't quite as comedically inclined, I guess I would say, as Girls Trip, which everyone in that movie is hilarious and they pull off the comedy really well. Because even Michelle Pfeiffer, who's very good, is not like strictly, she's not like a comedian, comedic actress. So you have two of them of your three leads that are um, 
not necessarily in that zone that would fit with the ridiculousness of the directing of Girls Trip. Um, whereas mine, I think that the leads of the movie with Ben Stiller, Chris Rock, and Kumail Nanjiani is a really interesting dynamic. Um, we've seen, obviously, Ben Stiller do his thing, and he can be great in that in that in those kind of roles. Chris Rock is Chris Rock. He is funny, especially when you put him in something like, picture Chris Rock doing things on a farm and how, how his reactions to what that would be in his, like, comments and all that like he he is very good at that um Kumail Nanjiani who's now ripped too is like so he might be able to be the strong man and do it but he's like I've not I've only like worked out my um beauty muscles because in New York just trying to like you know look good and, and it's actually not good for a farm because he's never actually lifted something that you know is needed to pull in his life it's just like you know the the you know curls and whatever um, you, you get, get owned muscles. Yeah, yeah, glamour, glamour muscles. muscles. That's, 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 those are the muscles I'm biceps, talking about. Biceps yeah. and pecs, baby. Yep, that's pretty much all and he's abs. done. Right, so yeah, you get that where everyone thinks he's this super strong like guy and be able to lift things and can't actually do it well because that's all he's ever worked out. You get um, uh, Owen Wilson, who plays the Southern kind of guy pretty well. He's done it in a few movies, and he can be the kind of cowboy leading the uh, – like. so the dynamic of my guys, we have Robert Downey Jr., who is like the lead – um, unrecognizable role, like weird suit type. He's the head of the farm. Then you have Owen Wilson, who is like the in most of the movie, where he is giving everyone the orders and directions. Two minutes. And you have him interacting with everyone. Then you have Taika Waititi, who they hired to do a lot of jobs. So he's there, like hired work, but he's now passing the work off to these guys that are visiting. So like, I like that dynamic of the power structure in the South. What I that... like in mine is I so... I think you mentioned oh Malcolm D. Lee's done like a girls comedy movie before it's like okay sure ben stiller has also done tons of comedy before and i think this is a pretty boring choice for the ben stiller rule to just have him be on this the, like the comedy of the list it was like oh this is the obvious easy option i want to do something a little bit more creative with my real choice and i think you made the most boring choice and you turned it into just another like high cast like big name cast comedy that i think is just going to be like fine and it's kind of no go nowhere after that like you see these all the time where it's like oh they got a bunch of big funny actors to be in this Big funny oh. movie, and then I people watch it, fair, and then no one talks about it again. To be fair, I think we both chose the easy rule because this was the other rule that I was thinking for this. Because like, oh, instead of men in their midlife crisis, it's now a woman going through a midlife crisis. And, and it's I think the Michelle Pfeiffer is a great, so. be a lot, a really fun dynamic to this movie where she's like this Southern belle who's become like a New York hippie, you know. And I think that would be a really fun interaction to have. And she has that kind of spunk still. She's very energetic, and she doesn't take shit from people. That's the kind of character yeah. she is. And I think these characters could be really fun and. Like you mentioned, Michelle Pfeiffer isn't a comedy comedy actress, and I think that's fine. Like she's shown that she can pull off comedy in the past, and I think like even her Catwoman performance is very comedic and very like big, and I think she could bring a, that kind of big energy to something like a girls trip where she's allowed to be like slapstick and be fun and be ridiculous, and I think it would when, be fun to see her do that. But when that. you're but when you're pairing a director who whose comedy like in Girls Trip is is more out there and kind of on the ridiculous scale in that. I think you need actresses or actors, whoever, that have shown they can do that in the past and really excel like at it. Tim Burton so, and making Catwoman? Well, like that, that was and, and yes, very good, but it's not the same style. It's not the same type of thing. She, and just part of the appeal of this, I think, is you're taking like, taking these two actresses who aren't typically in these slapstick comedies and you're throwing them into this ridiculous comedy. And that would wait, be kind wait, of who was your third? Too. Who was the third one? Because we're focusing oh, my, on the I have my cast yeah. is Kate Winslet, Michelle Pfeiffer, Selma Hayek, and Halle Berry. Selma Hayek and Halle Berry, I think. Again, all of them, yeah, some, but no one is going to be the standout comedic performance. None of, no one of that group is like, oh, they are the big comedic character that's going to get the big last. Yeah, that other people, one that other people can react. All the other characters, I think they they all would have good moments and they would all would have moments to shine. And when you you bring in like that one character that's hilarious, you end up getting like, I don't know, no. Like, I, Ghostbusters that, and, or something. It's like you have the one almost, character. In almost all the really comedies, funny. in almost all comedies, you at least have a like a side character, someone who is more comedic. Especially if you have your people playing the straight man or straight woman in this case, Michelle you need Viper someone to be the opposite she's of that. A, I know she is. Very need, very ridiculous character. Who, Kate Winslet's very, very. Uh, wait, who is the large one? The, Michelle Pfeiffer is the larger than life character compared so to. So just the mom and the daughter, and then and then why is the friend along? Who is what is she? What's her role? They're the they're part of the the team. I mean, they're they're all going out to reclaim their youth, and they're all going out to have like a girls' weekend together. And I they're they're like a team of of friends. They're going off on a trip together. Like they don't they all have good comedic moments, and they all have moments where they're playing off of each other. And they all and Michelle Pfeiffer is the kind of crazier one, and and 
like that's just the dynamic of the cast like most like, you get something like the hangover and it's like oh you got okay you got what four guys are going on their journey together and they each have like their role of the comedic role to play and that's what i'm going for with mine i mean you have a, you have a team of fun women who can go on this trip together and i would love to see michelle pfeiffer get that performance I think yeah but even with, even in even in hangover you have two straight up comedians as two of right. two of your leads and then more of a all right i think i think i know where i'm leaning it's been six minutes so far uh Johnny, what are your what are your thoughts? Maybe you can. Um, you know, personally, I mean, I'm not making a decision, but if I were, I, I would definitely go Tristan here. I think um, Girls Trip should be remembered as highly as like people talk about Bridesmaids, and I think Bridesmaids is so overrated, and I think Girls Trip was great and didn't get enough praise. I love uh, Tristan's director. He also did the great underrated undercover brother back in the day ah. as well as he is doing um wu-tang uh an american saga he's doing the wu-tang clan uh biopic show with shamik moore that's that's good so i know he can direct people very well he's not only done super outrageous comedies and i like tristan's idea because i you know i don't think you necessarily need all these outrageous characters if like as your leads if you have kind of crazy things going on around them I trust Tristan's actors and actresses because I, they're they're very good. Um, I like his pitch better. I think Bobby hit some ideas, but I think Tristan took him down pretty well, saying like, you know, we've seen Ben Stiller. We've seen, I think we've seen the peak of Ben Stiller's comedic directing, and I would have liked Bobby maybe to go a little more dramatic or kind of question like a movie of Ben Stiller, and then instead of Chris Rock, it's like Rob McElhenney and Camille because they're just two comedic dudes that got ripped and he that's what's giving him kind of the midlife crisis um, because his two best friends like got in shape and all this so he wants to go on an adventure or something. I think that would have been more interesting and something we haven't really seen. Um, But Bobby's does sound kind of by the numbers and Tristan's um, sounds a little more interesting and something that I would definitely go see. So that would be what I would go with if I was making the decision. But Joe has the cards and uh, over there in his hand. Uh, yeah, I went back and forth uh, quite a bit with this one. Um, one of the things I was looking for more in Tristan's was like more of that comedic edge. But honestly, like having like a Tiffany Haddish or someone in there. But the more he talked about it, the more I understood his reason why. And uh, I, I like his cast and I like the idea of some of them who have done like comedy here and there kind of in a more... Uh, comedy i really like the ending of his movie and uh bobby's is like a tropic thunder kind of thing which i like but i feel like to a certain extent maybe it's not quite as good as you know people talk about it but at the end of the day i think tristan i, I give the slight edge to there you go all right i, all right. I do think too it was very bobby close kind of hurt, bobby yeah. kind of hurt his own argument when he's um trying to say that like I don't picture Michelle Pfeiffer as this outrageous character, but then brought up Tom Cruise in Tropic Thunder, and it, you never would have seen him as that outrageous character before that movie. So I think if someone's a good actor, I yeah. can see them doing yeah. pretty much any role. And yeah. I, I think that yeah. kind of backs was, up Tristan's point. No, Bobby, I knew, I knew they could pull it off. Yes. That, I knew they could pull it off, but that's just fighting in this game. See, yeah. so. That's the argument you had to make. It's yeah. almost one of those things where, cause I was thinking the same thing. And if Bobby didn't bring it up to attack Tristan, not giving Tristan the chance to defend it, I think I end up choosing yeah. uh, Bobby. I and... thought about, I thought about that halfway through me bringing it up. I'm like, I should have left that alone, <laughs> <laughs> but all right, but I got to run to the bathroom. So I'm going to choose rebels of the neon God and I'm going to let Tristan yes. go first and I'll be right back. And that, if you can tell by Johnny's reaction, was his pick so yeah yeah but you guys can't get but you guys couldn't figure out who chose the obscure taiwan film from 1992 um so uh i'm guessing most people probably aren't familiar with rebels of the neon god but it, again it came out in 90, 1992 it's a taiwanese film it's fantastic it's directed by Tsai ming Lin. um and i have a short description of it here a cab driver's son played by kang Cheng lee quits his college studies to get revenge on two petty thieves, Choi Jun Chen and Cheng Bin Jin, um, that vandalized his father's car. It's kind of the basis of it, but it's a good, it's a good drama. It's got a, uh, kind of a, uh, like a love circle in it. It's got a lot of, uh, teenage, uh, angst and everything like that. I think it's a fantastic film. I recommend it to anyone who's interested in, uh, 
foreign films especially. So I'm interested to see, uh, Tristan, I believe you're going first. Uh, what, what are you got for us? Wait, does Bobby, can Bobby hear? Um, that I'm not sure. So if he Maybe can't, we'll then probably, yeah. So one of the things, uh, we'll I talk. I gotta get, you talk, I gotta get more water. So I'll be good. All right. So one of the things I was going to bring up, number one, uh, if you're watching the Bad Batch, uh, me and Tristan do a Bad Batch review every Friday. Uh, around seven o'clock so check that out another thing i was going to bring up winner of this match like we said faces bobby for uh the championship and i know johnny can here so yeah just like we said uh that's why pressure's on you know pressure's on right now because if tristan wins this round he wins the point and i know johnny can hear us because he has wireless headphones so tristan if you're ready uh you can start your pitch all right uh for my city slickers i use the rule that uh i mean at city slickers <laughs> for my <laughs> Rebels of the Neon God, I use the rule that it has to be a 1970s movie. And for my director, I went with, uh, my movie comes out in 1975, first of all, and it would be a couple of years after William Friedkin did The Exorcist. So that's my pick for my director, William Friedkin. Uh, He did The Exorcist, of course, which was like a humongous hit and put him on the map. But he also did French Connection, which was also a a huge hit for him. And I think shows you can work with him like the crime thriller genre which is what i'm going for with my neon god movie it's going to be like a 70s crime thriller with a love story at the center of it and i think william Friedkin could capture uh that tone really well and my cast i have uh for my lead i have uh pam greer is the daughter of a taxi driver who uh gets his car vandalized by al pacino isn't it as well he's a young al pacino uh and they uh, these two kind of foiled characters who are in very different uh, lives in this city and very different kind of lifestyles. We follow them as this, similar to the first movie, which is like incredibly good. We have these two kind of parallel storylines at the beginning. Uh, where we're following Pam Greer and we're following Al Pacino on their kind of like individual uh, trajectories. And we're seeing like what brings them together. And a lot of these, like you could do kind of like thematic parallels and things like that. I think William Friedkin does that really well of kind of weaving drama within like genre stuff because i think the exorcist does that really well it's just horror but it also has the family drama it has that kind of personal drama and stakes that adds to it a lot and i want to have michelle pfeiffer and Al Pacino dealing with that they're both dealing with some societal pressures michelle pfeiffer's uh you know a or, i mean not michelle pfeiffer i keep saying michelle pfeiffer because my mind is stuck in the city slickers mode it's pam greer <laughs> uh but pam greer yeah she's kind of like trying to break out and uh, go to school and in that kind of path and she's constantly being pulled back into like this street life and that's kind of her struggle is like thematically she's trying to get out of this life but she keeps getting kind of like dragged back into it and maybe Al Pacino is kind of a character who's like embraced the street life and doesn't really kind of have any aspirations towards getting out of it he's like hey this is the life there's, there's no there's no journey out of it I'm just here you know uh, living on the streets and we kind of follow these characters as they, as they bond and they interact and they have these like happenstance encounters and uh, they, they connect eventually where she she's ready to take down this guy. She's like, how dare this guy vandalize my father's car? I'm taking out my vengeance on this guy. I'm bringing him down. But ultimately, as she gets to know him and as they get to see each other, uh, they kind of bond a bit and they see each other's struggles. And we kind of get a slow romance story of them falling for each other, not entirely falling in love, but like just kind of wanting to see each other as valuable and, and we get this kind of budding relationship where by the end they're not in love they're not together but like they are now close and we have this hint of like maybe they can help each other get out of the situation pam greer uh is helping her father with his cab business by the end so she kind of has a subversion where she is not going to school and getting a degree in that direction but she's following a business pursuit by helping her father's business and el pacino is kind of steps up a little bit and says like oh i'm going to try it and and not break the law for my career. You know, I'm gonna get a real job even if it sucks, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to go the straight and narrow path a little bit. So we get a bit of growth for them in this journey, and I think William Friedkin could capture that really well with stuff like French Connection. I think it would be a really fun movie in his career, and that's my pitch for uh, the Rebels of the Neon God in the 1970s movie. All right, uh, Bobby, what is your pitch? Well, I got to say, I hate the rule choice, which is why I went with to make mine a 1970s movie. Um, So 
my movie is going to be in, uh, I, I put it in 1978 or 79, somewhere in that range. Um, so a few years after Taxi Driver, because my director is Martin Scorsese. Um, my lead of the movie is going to be an up-and-coming actor at the time, kind of teen star. I kind of went with three teen kind of stars at this point, but Scott Baio, um, kind of the clean-cut kind of guy that could, um, I think, be interesting to see go down the path. I'm going to have him go. Uh, the other two that are going to be the thieves in the movie are going to be Jodie Foster, um, who he's worked with before, and then Robbie Benson, who is another teen star from the 70s. If you look him up, he was very big at the time. And, and then Scott Bayo's father is going to be played by Robert De Niro, who he's obviously worked with before. Um, so this is going to be a coming-of-age crime movie set in Las Vegas, uh, which is the neon god um, because of all the neon going on in Vegas, and that's kind of the parallel they're going for. Um, that shows what kind of the drug, sex, and crime teenagers can get into while being brought up in a city like that. So Scott Bayo is the son of a taxi driver who is going to school at the same time. When his father's car is vandalized, he gets mixed up with two petty criminals played by Robbie Benson and Jody Foster. His, his, he doesn't know initially that they are the ones that um, vandalized the cab, and his whole goal of getting into it is to get revenge on the people who did. Um, so that kind of comes to a head later in the movie. He is very much a loner in the, be in the beginning of the movie and is just kind of getting by trying to go to school uh, and help his dad with his taxi cab business. Doesn't have any friends, but then he falls very hard in with this group with Robbie Benson and Jodie Foster. Um, there's a romance involved between uh, him and Jodie Foster. Um, and we do see a Martin Scorsese movie where he starts out with very kind of petty crimes going in with these three and getting involved, and he starts ramping it up, up and up and up and gets more and more dragged down into the city and into what um, what it can do. And he becomes and doing riskier and riskier crimes leading to a, a, uh, um, a murder um, that he didn't intend on doing when he first gets there, but does it in front of his two friends. And so at the end, he ends up alone. So he starts out alone, gains his friends, um, and then does something so crazy that he even sends them off. Uh, and it shows kind of what a kid, a good kid on a good path can um, can be when caught up in the toxic nature of a city uh, and also with the people that he meets. But also it does show the nature versus nurture thing because it's going to show Robert De Niro's character is actually kind of very much in the criminal world and his son did not know it. So he's trying to keep that a, a secret from him. So it's like, is he doing this because it's in his blood from his father or is he doing it because of the city that he lives in? Uh, so that's what I'm going for. All right. Okay. All right. I I uh I like that one. Um, Joe, I'm making the final decision, but do you have any questions? Uh, not really. Uh, the one thing I will say is about halfway through, uh, Tristan's pitch, I remembered what his rule was. So for the first half of his pitch, I was just picturing like present day, uh, Pam Greer <laughs> and uh, Al Pacino, and I, and then immediately when I remembered he was doing a 1970s movie, I'm like, oh yeah, this movie just got a lot better than what I was imagining. So <laughs> I will say that. That would be an interesting movie with uh, current age Pam Greer fighting against current age Al Pacino. That does kind of bring me to my, my question for Tristan because I, I don't want it to impact my judging without you having um, at least addressed it if it doesn't come up in the fights. I feel like the key elements of the, the original movie are like kind of teenagers kind of coming of age. Bobby kind of hits on that. Um, it's younger people, teen stars and stuff. Um, you don't have teenagers in yours. I mean, Pam Greer would have been 26 at the time and Al Pacino would have been 35. So you kind of get rid of that element in yours. And you also seem to get rid of like the love triangle, which I think is a very interesting aspect of the original. So just kind of address that and kind of defend it. And then we'll get into the, the fight. I'll say that I went a little bit older with my casting. Cause I wanted to make it a coming of age story for like a bit older people, people who are like kind of out of the college age and they're trying to figure out like what they're doing next with their lives. And what's now, now that I'm entering like the beginnings of adulthood, what am I going to do? And it's kind of a different take of a coming of age. You've seen a lot of teen coming of age movies. So I wanted to make it a little bit older for my characters where they're past the point you typically think of a coming of age story, but they're still trying to come of age, you know? And at 35. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, <laughs> that happens all the time. And like, it's plenty of movies where yeah. people are old and coming to come in, finding themselves still, you know? And I think, yeah, it doesn't uh, sound as old now that I'm approaching 30. 
yeah, as a kid, 35, I was like, oh my god. But now I'm like, <laughs> okay, that's like a couple of years. Oh my gosh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> but and I also want to address the love, the love triangle, where I didn't necessarily have there be another love interest, but I wanted to give uh, Pam Greer like she's drawn to this El Pacino kind of rebellious lifestyle, but she's also pulled towards her father and towards like this more by the books, by the numbers kind of lifestyle. And she doesn't have another love interest, but she has this family pull that's bringing her, pulling her towards being loyal to her family, especially because they're both from different races. And when they're living on the city streets, race is such a big divide that her going between the racial divide to even just be friends with El Pacino's character is a big, is a big uh, social move. Yeah. And just really quick, because I don't know if I brought it up I don't think I said it necessarily because I said there's romance, but there's the love triangle where Jodie Foster and Robbie Benson are a couple as the, you know, criminal, as the petty uh, criminals. And then Scott Bayo comes in and he starts kind of, you know, having a little affair with her at the same time. So there's the pull between her, between the two, two guy, two male leads as well. Yeah. Everyone needs to see more Scott Bayo in their lives. Um, yeah, I guess just yeah, fight it out. And you guys got five minutes, and we'll minutes. we'll see uh, we'll see who wins. I really like my cast. Sure, they're older, but I think they're great actors, and I would love to see them have this uh, chance to play off of each other. And uh, I think it should be a great role for them too to work with uh, William Friedkin and to get that chance to work with such a legendary director, especially early on, slightly early on in their career. Still, they're not like the huge level icons that we know them of today. And I think this would be one of the movies that we look back on is like this is one that put. Uh, Pam Greer and Al Pacino like on the map of people we talk about today. I, I would love to see that dynamic between those two characters and those two actors. Yeah, and I would say for mine, what was very important, I think, to me was the aesthetic of like the main character being Scott Bayo, who is very clean cut and at that age, very like you expect him to be the good kid and the good guy going down the right path because that's where he starts in the movie. And to be able to see him turn darker. And I think with Martin Scorsese, he can get a good performance for sure out of a young teen actor like him at the time. You also have people like Jodie Foster, who, who he's worked with before, and Robbie Benson, who was an established actor, teen star at the time, where he would do the job just very well. Um, then obviously Robert De Niro. So I think my I think it is important for this story to have the younger kind of coming of age teens um, in this, especially um, to. Just to just to bring the themes of the first one back and to make sure that that is what goes through with a reboot of this and make sure that's what is um, put on screen because um, like you like yeah 35 26 year olds like you can say they're coming of age but for the most part they have um, and they may you but they you're able like to... that's the whole plot of the thing like there there are these stuck in this adolescent mindset like even though Pacino he's older but he's he's stuck in this mindset of oh I'm not going to change my life I'm just good how I am and like you can come of age not just as a fourteen yeah. year old. Like <laughs> everyone can have a coming of age moment and have a moment where they like turn and, yeah. and change their lives a bit. But I do think that the the one of the more important ones is on the precipice of adulthood, where you are like that seventeen, eighteen, about to be on your own. You're about to make your final decisions of like, all right, what am I going to do with my life? Um, and you have like he's on such a good path, and then just because of one event and getting dragged down that path that it kind of ruins his entire outlook and what he's going for. And also I always like when titles make sense and like the rebels of the neon God and the original has a lot to do with like prophecy um, and the city as well that they are in. Um, it's a, it's a lore, like a, it's a Taiwanese kind of old um, story kind of deal where the neon God in this can be referenced to the city of Las Vegas. And it's, it is the neon God. It drives, um, kind of every like if you live there you're under the neons like the spell of the city um and you uh can get caught up in it and and all that so i, I like that that makes sense personally for me and the I, neon I think... god in my movie is the city itself like in there and then being rebels towards the neon, Two to the neon god is like them rebelling and refusing to be part of that like systemic uh like you you have this role set for you and that's what you are and them being the rebels is them saying no i'm not gonna fall into that city life trap that i see all people around me falling into all my friends falling into and even mm -hmm. though i'm a couple of years past like my coming of age moment i still have a chance to revive my life and change my life and i'm gonna i'm not gonna fall into that trap of just saying oh well i tried and now it's over but i just think it is that storyline is more compelling when they are younger personally like even your story i think is more compelling if they are younger 
I um, think we've seen that happen and, so many times, though. I think it's more interesting to have a bit older of a character. But also, all right, let's let's get into already had that journey. And and also director choice, like Friedkin obviously and Scorsese are both amazing directors. There's don't get me wrong, but for this crime type of story that he that Scorsese has done and and done very well, this could be one of the first times that he tells, um, not not the first time, but like it's not before it's become a gimmick for him or a a trope for him to do this. And it can show for a younger group of people what can what crime what the life of crime and what that can do. We know that Scorsese can tell an amazing story that way, um, and I think that it just is a better fit at the time, uh, personally, I think for the story. When you look back, though, like Scorsese's done enough of these movies, and like I it came up, this movie, your movie comes out what two years after Taxi Driver, and we're having Robert De Niro playing a taxi driver in this gritty crime mm -hmm. drama. Like it's gonna feel like he's just doing the same thing over again, even though he's still slightly new to the genre at this point. Like he's already done he is. stuff that yeah, is in new his genre and he's just doing it again. And when you look back at it in 2021 lenses, it's just going to be like another Scorsese mob movie that kind of blends in with the rest. And especially coming right after Taxi Driver, I feel like everyone would talk about Taxi Driver and be like, oh, but then there was also this movie, I guess that was fine or whatever. But I just don't think it would be one that stands the test of time because he's done so many great mob movies. I just don't think this is one that's going to stand above some of the all time great ones he's done. It's been five minutes you, if you, you want could, them to. Yeah, I was going to say, you could say the same thing about Friedkin's career at the time. You could place it like it was right before this and after this, it'll be forgettable. But if it's a good movie, it won't be forgettable. It, forgettable. it, it will be the one that stands out at the time. I don't think it stands yeah, out if you're doing the same character beat with Rap De Niro. Like, you just played a taxi driver. It's not the same beat. Just because that's his occupation doesn't mean the character's the same. They're very different. It's just that it, it works out that way for this story. I, I think I have my decision made i i went back and forth so i wanted to fight a little longer but i think i've heard everything i need to joe um i don't know if you're familiar with the original film but if you had to choose one of these films what would you go with uh what one of the things i will say is a lot of the things um tristan used to defend his movie i don't know if they hold up so much like when you remember that it is supposed to be a 1970s movie like if this movie came out in 19 you know 78 79 like bobby says you don't have a lot of those 80s and 90s teen coming of age movies so i don't think this is necessarily like oh it's just another teen coming of age movie and then one of the things i will say too is especially in like the 70s a lot of people in their like mid 30s and late 20s were kind of expected to be uh like married and settled down by yeah, then. so, I, I, so mean, I, that's I, the whole point of the movie yeah I, I just don't know if like necessarily like i think that storyline would hit more today when you have a lot of more people like in a coming of age moment because people are getting married and stuff later where i don't know if that necessarily hits the same in the late 70s so just slightly I, i'm leaning bobby for other reasons but i just wanted this this was tough because uh you know at first i thought tristan's was kind of weak with the uh, the older cast and stuff but i think he did a good job defending that i can picture um his characters, the way he described them and kind of going through the struggles. And he's right. We haven't really gotten to see more of a coming of age tale of someone that is maybe still trying to do that past the point of like teenage um, age and stuff like that. I think that's a good dynamic. Bobby's. Um, um, I like the, I like the Jodie Foster choice. I don't give a shit about Scott Bayo. Um, and I don't, not super familiar with Bobby Benson, but I do like your director choice. I like the year you chose. Um, I think this as a, if I'm looking at it this way, I think the deciding factor came down to what movie could I really visualize more in terms of the director style and movies that maybe I've seen them do. Um, William Friedkin, I think, you know, Tristan talked about this being a weird follow-up for uh, Taxi Driver, but I think this would be just as interesting, like, or uh, forgotten about maybe if it's a follow-up to The Exorcist, and then it's, like, way different than anything we ever saw William Freed can do. So I'm not really sold on that argument either way. But I do think um, when I was picturing the movies, I got major vibes kind of from both of them, but mainly from Bobby's of uh, Mean Streets and a little bit of The Bronx Tale. And I can picture Scorsese doing another kind of Mean Streets. Um, and I don't think William Friedkin ever really showed that he can do like 
coming of age as much and doing the movie that Tristan described. I think Tristan described a good movie, but I don't know if it fits the director as well. And Bobby, I think his uh, plot fits his director just um, better. Sure, and, I, and I do think, yeah, but I think I think sometimes that that's good. Um, Tristan mentioned like, you know, or not really. I mean, I don't really have anything else to say. I mean, Tristan, uh, it was close. I really like your cast. I think Pam Gray and Al Pacino would have made for uh, good roles in this, but I do think just Bobby kind of has more of the elements of the original they want to see with like the love triangle um, and a little bit more of the coming of age. But I think it pictures, I would have liked Scorsese. If you look at his filmography after Taxi Driver, he kind of faltered with New York, New York or whatever that was. And it was like about a saxophonist. And then he did the last waltz and he didn't really come back onto his own until um, Raging Bull in 1980. I would have liked to have another type of Mean Streets movie in between Raging Bull and uh, Taxi Driver. So I think Bobby's fits in well. If he had gone with another year, maybe it wouldn't have worked, but I think Bobby chose the right year for, for his director. And I would have liked that to be in his filmography. So what it comes down to is I love both pitches, but I think Bobby edged it out just because I can picture it a little a little clearer. And what that does is tie us up going into game seven, baby. It can't be any other way. We're going for a championship oh, man. here. Man, my shortest Pressure team. is on. <laughs> my who, who, I mean, I'll admit I had up, like baby. a sentence down up, for the last man, pitch, I'm so I'm not too upset about losing. <laughs> who, who would have thought that all of this, the number one contender match, would come down to stop or my mom will shoot? <laughs> You guys can and we both, go for that. And by the way, we matched up again on our rule. Yep. <laughs> you guys matched up too much, all right? Oh, Mr. okay. <laughs> Just to give you some insight on what I, I would have uh, done the flip I flip the uh, genders of uh, Rebels of Neon God. I think that would have been. I started uh, with that, and movie to do. but I could tell my same story without doing that, and I could put that somewhere else that I thought made sense. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm interested because I think this is the one that I would have went with a 1970s movie because I think this would have fit in with a weird um, uh, <laughs> decade of filmmaking. Um, so Sorry. stop or my mom will shoot. <laughs> if you guys couldn't tell, by the way, I don't know if we mentioned this up top, but we went with movies that came out between 1990 oh, yeah. and 1994. Um, so this came out in 1992. It was directed by Roger Spottiswood. Um, I guess there's a plot, so... Uh, smarting from a romantic breakup, Macho Police Sergeant Joe Bomowski, played by Sylvester Stallone, gets a cross-country visit from his mother, Tutty, played by Estelle Getty. Her misguided efforts to help only fray his nerves, but that doesn't stop her from, uh, from nagging Joe to be more open about his feelings towards his ex-girlfriend and current boss, Lieutenant Gwen Harper, Joe Beth Williams, um... When Tutty uh, witnesses a brutal multiple murder, she takes her wedding to the, or her meddling to the extreme by tagging along to help her son solve the case. That is uh, a movie that actually came out and was made, it's premise, and right? it's a premise. So I'm interested to see what you guys did with that premise because no other, yeah, the best way to tell who should face me for the championship is their pitches of Stop. the reboot of Stop oh, or My Mom Will Shoot. Sure. I'm glad it's coming down um, to such a such a great movie on the way. Well, very well regarded. Yeah. One Classic. of the only movies that has the exclamation point in the middle the of very, the title. It's the like, panic. <laughs> it's the panic at the disco of movies. <laughs> there, there That's you a go. way of describing it. All right, so Rouge. Tristan, who's going yep. first? I'll go first on this one. Okay. Just so you can so, get your very similar story out of the way. Yeah, you know, I got to get ahead of you on this one. Uh, so I hope you use the that... same pitch. <laughs> yeah, really It'd be hilarious. Oh, our, our bad. So if you guys have been following, Christopher uh, Walken is our is our last rule here. Uh, well, my feature, Christopher hope, Walken. I hope he's the mom. <laughs> and I have Christopher Walken as the dad who will shoot. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> Chris Hemsworth plays his son, Joe. And uh, Margaret Qualley plays Joe's kind of... Uh, stepdaughter who is from a, a divorce and he's been distant from his daughter and his family but and he's kind of like the slacker cop who would rather kind of sit on the side of the road eating donuts and not really and being involved too much in, in solving crimes but uh his ridiculous distant father played by christopher walken 
uh, comes home for a Chris, uh, Christmas party uh, unexpectedly. They haven't seen each other in a very long time, and he shows up and says, oh, Merry Christmas, I'm here to uh, be part of your life again. And I mentioned my director was Shane Black. He's a Christmas hound, <laughs> so I, I made sure to set it in his Christmas setting. Uh, so when the ridiculous isn't father comes back, he ends up being a happenstance witness to a uh, serial killing. And uh, now Chris Hemsworth, Joe, and Christopher Walken have to work together to catch this serial killer on Christmas Eve. And we get this nice co fun comedy similar in tone to like the nice guys where it's like just these characters out of their wits trying to solve this increasingly bizarre crime that's just kind of falling into ridiculousness as they go along. And I think uh, Hemsworth and Walken could play off of each other in a similar way to the characters in that movie where Hemsworth is, is very much uh, a huge different uh, actor from Walken. Walken is such like a high energy kind of like intense persona type person. Hemsworth is like the pretty guy who's been in really good stuff, but he's not, he's not like the high energy weirdo kind of living meme of Christopher uh, Walken at this point. And, and I think it would be really just a fun adventure story. You follow them kind of through the beats of this mystery and following through some uh, suspects that just go nowhere and they get increasingly confused about who this killer is. And eventually they do, of course, uh, find the killer on Christmas Eve night and they make it home just in time for Christmas dinner with their family. And we get some father-son bonding a little bit here where Christopher Walken's been a distant father and he's getting a chance to bond with his son, Chris Hemsworth. And you get a parallel to Chris Hemsworth deciding to be more active in his stepdaughter's life. So you get a little bit of a learning curve for both of the characters, but it's mostly a fun Shane Black comedy with two really fun actors in the lead. And that's my pitch. All right, that actually sounds like relatively decent compared to what I expected from either of your stop or my mom will shoot pitches. So, <laughs> uh, Bobby, what is your pitch? All right, uh, so to start, my director of this movie um, is going to be, well, directors are John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein from Game Night. I think they bring a good energy that I want, kind of consistent, um, kind of amping up the energy throughout the movie. Um, my, uh, the, the son in this movie is going to be played by Christopher Walken, and his mom, who's going to be the mother, is going to be played by Betty White, because she is 21 years older than him, and I think that's a really fun dynamic. Um, the police chief that they're going to interact with a decent amount is going to be played by Jane Lynch. So I think having a woman kind of uh, stern police chief like that is a pretty funny, like, and she's very good to have that concept. I think that works out very well. Um, my main villain in the movie of the person that is involved with these murders is going to be played by Jesse Plemons, uh, who is also the neighbor in Game Night. Um, and he's a very good actor. And then his main dumb henchman is going to be played by Billy Magnuson. Um, so I do have, it's a similar plot where Betty White, so Christopher Walken's character is thinking about retirement, but at the same time, he also, um, is debating whether or not he wants to be a police chief himself. Like he kind of wishes he had the role of Jane Lynch's character. So he feels a lot of contempt towards her, which leads to a lot of like kind of interesting interactions. Um, and then Betty White, his mom, um, comes to visit just as he and his partner are investigating, um, a case and like kind of the normal thing he they witness a murder um that's involved in a drug ring um and that was that was done by billy magnuson and, Jill, and jesse plemons is kind of the lead of that and we get a like like tristan said it's a very fun um buddy cop kind of interesting movie but mine i went with kind of the two older actors being the mother son which i think changes the dynamic and be, can be pretty fun i like having um christopher walken coming back into a lead role and being his kind of bizarre self and then Betty White being her badass self at 99 being and she just hasn't changed being the mom who is like wielding a shotgun or something like you know like that type of stuff at, at, in moments of the movie um, so again, it's it comes down to at the end that you know Christopher Walken works with his mom and they had a very very, very contentious relationship because she thinks he should have done better with his life um, and then she comes to realize all that he's done at the end of it um, and the, what he's really become. And he thinks, and he, instead of retiring, tries to pursue um, being a, a police chief and kind of accepts the whole thing with Jane Lynch. So the, at least you have a little bit of the arc, but mostly throughout most of the movie, you have the ridiculousness of the older Christopher Walken and his mother, who's still alive, even though he's in his 60s, 
um, you know, coming along on this investigation, um, and she ends up, you know, holding the holding Jesse Plemons hostage at the end with a shotgun, saying "Stop or I'll shoot" type of thing, um, while uh, Christopher Walken can make the arrest, and it's like just fun, ridiculous craziness between the two of them. I, I like that last fight. Um, most of it was based on like being too old to come of age, and Bobby's <laughs> is basically yep. that times like a thousand. <laughs> it's not coming, of, it's not coming of age. He's realizing that he can, you know, be the police chief and move on with his life. It is a little well, bit. It's, re- it's like, okay, re- retiring, right, like well, retiring and like being young like or being a chief. It's like the two things you can go yeah. into when you're at that age. Yeah, he's coming of old age. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that would be the tagline. Um, all right, Joe, you're making the final decision here, so have fun with that. Do you have a question for them? Uh, not really. I think I kind of know uh, what uh, kind of the general direction of both of their movies. I'm I'm leaning a certain way, but I won't say which way. Uh, do you have any questions for either of them? Um, I'll say this. I like... I like the dynamic of both of your casts. I like uh, Chris Hemsworth with Christopher Walken, and then I like Betty White with Christopher Walken in a much different kind of thing. Um, I like both casts a lot. I like the director choices. Um, What I would say in the fight is just focus on, this is your ticket to the championship. Just fight for your lives. Why is your movie worthy of a shot at my belt? All right. To start out, I think that with a movie like Stop and If Your Mom Will Sh- or Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, um, to even remake that, you have to go ridiculous because that movie is known as being one of the worst movies of all time. If you try to make it a Shane Black kind of trying to take it serious, even though it's funny, like it's trying to be a relatively serious um, like movie with that. Uh, I don't think that's the way to go. As start serious as far as like, here's a big star with Chris Hemsworth here and and that. I think going absolutely ridiculous with Christopher Walken and Betty White being like, what the hell is this movie? Because those two starring in a movie now, now like right now, is insane. So I would love to see that, and I'd love to see them remake it for that reason. Your um, movie to me sounds like it. It's max quality is Hitman's Bodyguard level, where it's like, oh, it's so ridiculous that Samuel Jackson is. Those are two big Jackson. stars in a lame movie. That's the opposite of what mine is. You're telling me Betty White and Christopher Walken aren't big stars. People don't know who that is. Like current, you're doing the same stars. thing. You're taking, you're taking like this people who are way too old to be doing a thing, and then putting them into this movie, and it's like, oh, it's funny because they're old, <laughs> and it's like that joke's gonna run out pretty quick. And it sounds like it, it goes too ridiculous. Like sure, you're talking the old, the original movie is ridiculous, but I I still try to make mine a good movie that could actually be made and come out, and like people would actually like it. Your movie just sounds like a weird like. Kevin Spacey's voicing a cat in nine lines, isn't that weird? And it's like, oh, people will talk about it for a second and then never really talk about it again. And mine, I think, is one that could be down as a people's favorite movie. People love Shane Black, and I think this this could be one that he knocks out of the park and like he did for Nice Guys, and it's just like a really killer Shane Black comedy, and it just sounds like some stock, just like this, a movie that people would kind of know about, but no one's seen this. Like, (laughs) people would know of this movie, think that's all it really is going to be. I think the cast of my movie is strong enough that just because it's ridiculous, just because they're older, they're actually very good still at what they do. I think Betty White is still very sharp in anything she's been in and spoken in and everything. She's still hilarious and herself. And Christopher Walken does what he does. And he would be an entertaining lead to follow because he really hasn't led a movie in a while. And I'd like to see him be this, um, you know, older cop who's kind of just like, he is Christopher Walken. He has his, his weird talking and mannerisms and stuff like that, but he gets to interact with Betty White, who's the stern, over overbearing mother still at her age. I think that is actually very appealing. Um, and, like, look, Shane Black, I love the nice guys. It's fantastic. But he is very hit or miss. He can be very hit or miss. So this movie is either going to be a nice guys or it's going to be kind of bland. Um, and not and, and and kind of forgettable. And I think with who you chose, because Chris Hemsworth, he I love him in the Thor movies, but whenever he's let a movie outside of that, when he is, um, it's been, it's been okay or not very good. And then the one movie that was very good, which was Rush, 
Um, no one really went to see it, which is not, you know, two not minutes. that thing, but I, not too bad. When but I love that. Comedy, though, he's even he's great. Even in stuff like Ghostbusters, that was pretty bad. He stood out as like, oh, he's a great part of this movie. Like, but he's what? Just... But when he's a comedic lead, like in Men in Black, it's terrible. He's a comedic side character. And he's not. I mean, he's he. Christopher Walken is still in the movie. Like they're playing off each other as co-leads. So you're not getting Chris Hemsworth holding down the whole movie. And I, I just, I think they could have a great dynamic together. I think yours just goes a little too far into the ridiculous for me. I think mine feels like an actual good movie. And you want to talk about like, oh, they're kind of hit or miss. Like your directors did Vacation, which was which was like terrible, and they did Game Night, which was good, and then they haven't done anything else. So I don't. I mean, like they're fifty fifty essentially on their directing so you want to talk hit or miss that's as hit or miss as you get like you're 50 50 on quality terms and i think shane black can bring that kind of star power to it where people are going to have it's going to have the attention that this movie kind of deserves and people aren't going to be like oh i can't wait to go see the next movie with the, from the directors of game night but i think shane black has that cult following that would bring people out to see this and talk about it and give it a following where you're saying oh christopher walken who hasn't really been in a movie in a while is playing this really fun comedic character he's leaning a bit into like his craziness and what you know of him as an actor and not trying to play a cop at like his 60s and he's like oh i want to be captain and i want to be chief it's like no police department ever is going to give a 60 plus year old man like the chief position that's not how it works like <laughs> their political yeah. positions are going to give them to a young person they're not going to give them to somebody who's five police chiefs police chiefs to actually do tend to be a wide variety of ages but for one thing um I think the dynamic between my like heroes and villains where you can cut to both of them, I think lead to a, a variety of entertainment and two very different dynamics. Cause you have Jesse Plemons and Billy Magnuson um, who are like your comedic villain duo. And then you have Christopher Walken and Betty White and Christopher Walken with the way he speaks can very much come across as the um, like not as sure of himself kind of thing where Betty White is super stern and everything. I think that dynamic works really well between the two of them because he can be very confident when he's speaking to someone else and then he speaks to his mom and he like falls back into like what he was as a kid um and that's kind of how he initially interacts with jane lynch's character which is why no one sees him as like the the um police chief but then he comes into his own after this whole whole thing um but again i i think i think Shane Black doing a buddy cop, like that's usually a go-to. Like, you know, you can throw that in to do just about anything, but I think it's more interesting to go a little bit different with it and go, like, look, if you're going to make this movie, usually you're going to put a big star like Chris Hemsworth in it, but every time they've done that so far, like in Men in Black International, it has not gone well when he's been the lead in that type of role. I'd like to see them make something that is very eye-catching to people being like, whoa, what is this? And then have it be surprisingly entertaining rather than something that is expected where you have Chris Hemsworth in that type of role. And Mine's it gonna be an a little bit more movie. generic. This might be like an interesting All right, I have my... shock movie, but I definitely am, I think mine just sounds, I know you have your decision made already, but mine yeah. just sounds like a good movie and Bobby sounds like some bad comedy from a 50-50 shot director that hasn't really done anything spectacular. All right, uh, Johnny, what are your thoughts? Uh, all right i'm not gonna say who i would pick because i'm the champion this is gonna be to decide who the champion faces so i want 100 percent of the decision to be on joe i'll just kind of highlight what i liked about both pitches um because shockingly i liked both pitches of the <laughs> stop where my mom will shoot reboot so you guys both yeah. i think did a did an excellent job i do think both of your director choices are good um, Bobby mentioned the hit, the hit or miss and so did Tristan, but during your pitches, I got more of a game night vibe out of Bobby's than a vacation vibe. And I got more of a nice guy's vibe out of Tristan's than I did like, uh, um, like the predator or whatever else like he did vibe. So I do think both of you, um, did an interesting job. I think both of you have a good cast. There is a role that I would rather see Christopher Walken in out of what you pitched. Um, but I won't say what, um, and I'll wait until Joe makes his decision. Um, I will say what I liked. Um, the other thing I liked about Bobby's is I kind of like the idea of, uh, Jesse Plemons, like being the intense character. He wasn't breaking bad, but also being able to showcase his, uh, like dry, uh, comedy with his directors. And, uh, I do think Chris Hemsworth, I don't blame Chris Hemsworth for men in black international and things like that. I think he can lead a movie. Um, 
but I just don't know if he's been taking the right projects to do so. Um, but he's very good in, and I know it's another smaller role, but he's better. He's good in uh, what is the El Royale one. Oh, um, Bad Times at the El Royale. Bad Times at the El Royale. Like he's the best part of that movie. So I don't know. Yeah, he's the best part of almost every movie that he's in comedically, but he's never the lead character. But I don't think that that can say that he shouldn't lead one. So with that being said, Joe, you're making the decision. I won't show where I'm leaning. Uh, yeah, I think both of your movies could uh potentially be funny so it, it it's hard i had to go with what what do i think is more more what i'd be interested in what i think you know like the people at large would be more interested in and i think for me uh i think i agree to some extent with tristan that i think the uh uh christopher walk and betty white they're both kind of old thing could potentially you know, run out of steam after a while. And that was a big, you know, negative I had against his. And I just think overall, I like more the dynamic of Chris Hemsworth and Christopher Walken. It's like this father son duo in a Shane Black movie more. And I, you know, I agree with what Johnny said about, I don't really blame Chris Hemsworth for the movies he's been in being bad. Cause he's never been the bad in them. And so that's going to be where I go. Unfortunately for Bobby is I'm going to go with Tristan's stop. Fuck you, Bobby. Show. <laughs> there it is. There's the deal. I'm gonna be honest though. I I think I was leaning more towards Bobby, but I didn't want to show my cards because I just think everything else canceled out, and I'd rather see Christopher Walken playing the son at an old age than a dad. I think would be better. That's, him. But I I think either yeah. way, like both pitches were good. You guys did as good of a job as you could have done with with uh, Stop or I Almost Shoot. Except I will say, both of you. All the rule is is you must feature Christopher Walken, and both of you decided to make him no. the star of your. No, movie. he's the main character. I would have yeah. made yeah, him he's the, the chief main character in both. He should have I been was... the police chief. That's I know. Priority. And uh, personally, what I would have done, and um, you guys would have won me over with it, but I don't know if Joe's seen these. If you guys have seen either Thunder Road or The Wolf of Snow Hollow, Jim Cummings always plays like this cop that has like parent issues. So him being in this with a mom in that role, trying to become the police chief would be like incredible. Yeah. Um, and that's the way I would have went. I kind of thought about all these movies and what I would have done with them, what I would have paired off with them. And then I would have had like Christopher Walken as the, the funny, like police chief. Maybe he's the dad and the parents are divorced or something like that. Um, type yeah. of aspect. Would have been. Would, yeah. So I originally did have Christopher Walken as the police chief. And then I thought about it more and I just found it hilarious and I couldn't pass up the I, chance to have yeah. him and Betty White. That so that was that was what I I was like, you know what? No, fuck it. I'm going all the way, and I'm making it Christopher Walken and Betty White. So I'm okay losing on that because I loved my choice of that yeah. cast. Yeah, when I heard so that's the, okay. Betty White, it was a close fight. Yeah, yeah it, was it was. I was like, oh, I guess I lost this one because that's such a that's such a weird casting choice. I wish I went to it. I would definitely see that level of ridiculous in a movie you can yeah. never make a movie too ridiculous yeah. for me well i'm glad i won two out of the three people on the podcast <laughs> over but not the one that made the decision not the final <laughs> decision yeah maybe. yeah <laughs> but the thing too i do want to clarify because i feel like I, I was really harsh on tristan's page master what i meant about the rule choice is i think people fall into the trap when you have to set it into a fictional world of bringing in all of these characters like batman and like all these things that you don't need to do what I would have loved in the Page Master is if you guys set it in the world of Harry Potter, That's what I was... not had anything to do with Harry Potter, and it's like spell books that they fall into. Or yeah, something. I was gonna say that, then, yeah. uh, that's exactly set what I was it gonna in bring the up. World, but don't actually have the characters from the universe in it. I would have liked that better if you guys picked a fictional world that's established and then didn't tie it with any of the same characters, because that's what I think like The Hobbit made the mistake of, and a lot of these things that like can't just be their original own things they have to bring in characters for yeah that's why i was hoping you guys would do it that rule and then neither of you did it because bobby went with mcu and tristan went with dc and brought in all these yeah. characters yeah well my plan because i had thought some of these out and i was debating like would i have gone stop or my mom will shoot was originally going to be set in an established fictional world and i was going to do uh uh deckard shaw from the fast and the furious uh and helen mirren teaming up and more of like an action comedy type thing 
I don't know those movies enough to pick that. <laughs> yeah, my original plan was a hard target yeah. where it's Lex Luthor is the rich guy who's like hiring people to attack homeless people, and it's yeah. it's yeah. like some random DC villain. Yeah, I, I thought of that DC too, but I liked Moon Knight, so yeah. I tried to pitch a Moon Knight movie. I was shocked. I thought that it would be interesting to travel. Like you get this meta thing of getting into the world of Batman the Animated Series. Yeah. I think like, you I went too meta yeah. because I didn't like tying in Robert Pattinson into that world because the movie look so dark and great and then it would have been really jarring if he just showed yeah. up again if you had ben affleck showing up at the end i would have been like okay that makes more sense yeah and like page um, master i was page master i was thinking maybe to like tie it loosely with the world if you had it be like one of harry potter's kids or like one of ron and hermione's kids who's like this bully picked on kid who likes to read like the beetle the bard books and then through magic he gets put in the beetle the bard books which is a way for like harry potter fans that they could kind of see those books come to life in a story yeah. was that another direction yeah, I, think, I thought about going i think that would have been a cool one that was the one i would have picked um for setting in the fictional world and then doing like you know you have either the lord of the rings universe or the wizarding world and have and tie in like books that would be literary famous literary works in those universes compared to you know like uh Charles Dickens books and stuff yeah. like that, which is what we got. So I would like that. And then both of you went with comic books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I had a whole different variety of things and just, I have a Moon Knight comic that I was staring at as I was like writing this. And I was like, yeah. wait, you know, and so that kind wait, of. Wait, Nicholas Cage. Direction. Yeah, <laughs> it was. No, really, that is what I thought. I may have been a few beers deep. But that is what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> all right hey, so anytime you pitch a nick cage movie you're probably a few drinks deep um yeah. if you can look at all of our i want to say my favorite that. pitch from bobby in this episode was mouth of madness that was a really yeah. hard one to argue against and i i was really happy yeah. with my pitch i was very proud of what i had but bobby also brought a player on that one so it was like we i think both of us had great pitches from mouth you of had madness a, yeah really i loved your pitch line with the original movie yeah i that was one where i loved my pitch but i heard yours and i'm like oh shit i'm in for a battle so that might have been my favorite of yours, but of one that you won that I think was very fair and that I really liked was City Slickers. I think that was a, a good pitch. I, I had to fight yeah. against, uh, you know, Michelle Pfeiffer and um, Kate Winslet when I think they're amazing and like try to say that they can't pull off comedy. So yeah. when, it, when it's like, when it's clear that one person's stuck fighting like one thing, it's like they don't really have anything else to yeah. kind of knock on this movie. The, um, yeah, I'll say I loved almost every pitch you guys did. I the only pitches that I was disappointed by from both of you were both of your Stitches pitches with the fictional cool. universe one because I think you guys just brought in too many things and stuff into it. Um, but that being said, everything else was a super close fight. Um, I love both of your in the mouth of madness pitches. I love both of your um, rebels of the Neon god pitches. Even the ones when like originally you read them and I was like, I'm not sold on this. By the end of the fight. I was pretty sold on both pitches. So it was always a tough decision for the most part. And basically you guys canceled each other out with like me making an easy decision on hard target and the page master um, decisions. I think everything else though was, was like really tight and could have gone either way. So if Bobby had won, it wouldn't have surprised me, but Tristan, I look forward to facing you. Yeah. yeah, I look forward to beating Johnny. Yeah. You know, he lost against Bobby previously, and I feel like it's the downfall of Johnny. That's the arc this season. Johnny's getting taken down, and I had to put away the heel for a moment to team up against the real villain. But when I come to yep. fight Johnny, I won't be holding back at all. So just, yeah. I, I, I will... As long as we get rules that allow us to make good pitches, I will yeah. crush anybody that comes in my way. And Tristan, you are no different. Yep. So and I will say I'll... I'll be going from facing Tristan to rooting for Tristan, but I will be a very fair judge. You're not allowed to root for um, someone when you're I will, the judge. I can, I, can can mentally, those, by the way. I can mentally root for, uh, thank you for that, I, I'll take the 20 bucks, but I can mentally root for and also be a fair judge because I've done that many times oh, against Johnny and I had to admit, nope, that was a better pitch. Johnny won that one, so. You'll know be what? admitting that seven yeah. times next episode. There's nothing worse but than really I'm looking forward Johnny to it. in an episode. And I will say my favorite pitches of uh, my favorite pitch of Bobby was Rebels of Neon God. And I honestly think my favorite pitch of Tristan's, which is shocking to say, might have been Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. 
<laughs> Which is surprising because mine won two of the three, two of the three judges. But you know, yeah, but what it comes down to. But you know what? The, That's the, okay. The, I'll I'll be rooting for Tristan next time when when during the championship. But I'm I'm just excited for a legitimate championship match because we yeah. have not really had that yet yeah. in the, yeah. in our show. Yeah. Yeah, so the next. So we'll have to figure out. It'll be in probably two weeks, the actual championship match, and then we'll figure out what our week in between episode will be, or if there is one, because I know my schedule next week's a little crazy. So. Yeah, so. We'll have to see. So it's the been next... harder. Yeah. Pairing up our schedules, um, hence the weird one o'clock start time on a Sunday today. Yeah, yeah. the show is much easier when I didn't have a job. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, this so is our job, I mean, right? Yeah. Like, you yeah, know. we got paid for this. Once we start getting advertisements. <laughs> yeah. So we'll say next week the category is uh, for movies. It's just movies that won an Oscar. Uh, just any mov- any kind of Oscar. It could have just won for cinematography, for costuming, just any kind of thing. I think it leaves us open-ended. And normally how it goes is one judge picks three movies, the other judge picks three movies, and then they kind of come together and pick Uh, one movie to judge together and they come up with the seven rules but for a championship match we wanted to do something a little different so johnny as the champion will choose one movie tristan as the challenger will choose two movies and then me and bobby together will judge those three movies and then i will choose two movies and bobby will choose two movies for a total of seven movies so uh after this episode's over we'll probably get working on that and for the rules i don't know if i told anyone this yet but kind of what i was thinking for rules was doing more of like best of rules rules that in the past have given us two solid pitches or like one solid pitch or maybe you know it's a rule that's been in multiple episodes so that's kind of the direction i wanted to go as far as rules so i like it we'll work on that as well uh if anyone else has anything else to say i guess we'll sign off have a nice rest of your afternoon enjoy your memorial day uh congrats to tristan on the win and uh see you next time